I'll call this meeting to order um, and start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Mr. Fishbein. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll move on to recognitions. Dr. Marseille, do you want to introduce the recognized? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I want to first introduce um, uh, Mr. Mr. Wallace, uh, Principal of Elkins, the proud Principal of Elkins Park, who is here with uh, members of his team and will share briefly some wonderful things that have been uh, taking place. So, um, and then afterwards, um, we have Dr. Planarski, who I will uh, introduce, but um, now is the time if we can give um, Mr. Wallace, um, and I think Ms. Nelson is with us too, so she might be, she'll need permission as well, but I think, uh, one of you is going to share the PowerPoint, so we can give you permission to do that, and we can begin your uh, presentation. Absolutely. Ms. Nelson, can you share the PowerPoint for us? Yeah. All right. So as Mr. Nelson is getting uh, ready, I'll start. Uh, Elvis Park, we started out our school year, and uh, to the board and to the wonderful members of the Cheltenham community, to Dr. Marseille and Dr. Smith, um, we were bent on making sure that at Elkins Park, we created the best fifth and sixth grade virtual experience possible. And as I talk and learn about other things and even my own daughter's school, I, I think we can really stand behind the fact that at Elkins Park, we're creating a really great virtual experience with everything that is uh, taking place. And we wanna be the best fifth and sixth grade school, our goal. And I think that we really delivered the best fifth and sixth grade virtual experience possible. Uh, we did that by making sure that um, we follow the goals of uh, and mission statement of the district, um, by making sure that we strive to provide a safe, respectable learning environment, even a virtual environment for all members in our school community, uh, where they feel accepted, where they're encouraged, and they also are feeling valued. Um, our goal was to make sure that we at least made sure that 95% of our students were actively engaged and involved in the virtual environment. Well, I'm proud to say that as the recent data has come up, we're about 99% of our students, almost 100, are actively involved every day. When I mean actively involved every day, involved, turning in assignments with their camera on, um, and we're really proud about that. So we really want to click that, uh, put that claim that we were one of the best fifth and sixth grade virtual offerings in the entire Montgomery County and the entire uh, uh, Philadelphia area doing this. And that's because of the outstanding staff at Elkins Park. And I have to give a lot of credit to our outstanding students who were logging on with their cameras on, actively engaged and participating every day. Uh, and, Cole, I highlight, and I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Wallace, I just wanna highlight the Wordle is showing um, just the, the depth and breadth of uh, activities, digital um, resources that our teachers have worked diligently on compiling so that they can give all of our students the best opportunities for learning virtually. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. As we go on, another goal for us is to make sure that we're cultural proficient in all that we do. Um, there's a lot going on in the world today. Um, it was a, a very involved election, a very involved incident took place that concerned us all on Wednesday. And we don't just try to brush those things under the rug, even in the virtual environment, but we take time for the staff to digest that first. Um, and we also make sure that the kids have that open space to say what's on their mind, to have that open voice, as well as we educate and teach them along the way. And our cultural proficiency team has been doing some dynamic things with the staff, having us have open time to reflect and work together um, to hatch out some of the things that are going on so that we're best prepared to educate our students. And with the cultural efficiency lens on um, the goals of our superintendent with the guidance of Dr. Barbara Moore Williams. So we, we take that very seriously at Elkins Park. We had an outstanding um, thing happen to Elkins Park. Uh, we have one of our very own of uh, uh, what I would call alumni or former students, Mr. Arthur Haywood. Uh, who's a resident artist in many places, but he came back in his busy schedule and actually did a painting 
um, that we hung in our library. Uh, we actually had a dedication. Uh, we had one of our very own sixth grade students, Myer Marshall, who was actually depicted in the picture. The picture, if you know a little bit about Harry Potter, um, ties into um, the Harry Potter uh, legacy, but it also has the everyday um, of diversity of that picture. But it's one thing that we can have a lot of pride in that hopefully will be a mural that will be a part of Elkins Park for many years to come. So when I retire and I walk with a cane, or we all come back and we can say that that is a picture that was dedicated for one of our students under our watch. So a point of pride, even in the midst of a pandemic, and we're hoping to celebrate that more when time gets back to usual. But uh, we were very happy for that um, outstanding picture commissioned by our very own student, Mr. Arthur Haywood Jr. We also make time uh, to make sure that we do morning announcements as much as possible. I try to communicate over and over with the parents to make sure that they're involved as well. But we uh, have a, a wonderful teacher, Ms. Moore, who does a daily announcement every time and then futures me in the announcements. So uh, we always make sure that we reach out to the students to try to make it as normal um, as possible when we start every day virtually with these wonderful announcements. And we uh, have all kinds of ways to keep expectations high to make sure that we remind students of everything that they're supposed to do. We're continually doing this with a couple of uh, wonderful presentations that we'll have for our students coming up in our town hall meeting, as well as um, in the meetings uh, or information that we're giving to students to make sure that we put safety first, that we're outwardly kind, and we have respect and, resp uh, and responsibility um, as the things that we do at Elkins Park. One of our prides is we still want to make sure that we build a strong community um, in Cheltenham as well as uh, why this pandemic is taking place and as we start to, um, to move our way back to coming back into the building. We acknowledge students with success by doing a successful EP shout outs. Uh, we do all kinds of things to make sure that we mail a, um, a excitement, congratulations or caught being good or our EP shout outs that we actually put in the mail and send to students to let them know that we are recognizing you even in this virtual world. And as we end, uh, we continue to um, foster leadership um, even in the pandemic by making sure that we have a student leadership club that will continue even virtually. And when we come back with our hybrid model that we make sure that we're reaching out for students and make sure that they get involved as much as they uh, can even though this is like no year we've ever had before. Um, and we talk about things that show for our safety, public relations, we celebrate culture, um, and we do everything that we can to make sure that we um, promote those clubs and foster leadership at Elkins Park. So as we go to our last slide, um, we also are serious about making sure that we provide the best virtual experience for any fifth and sixth grade students anywhere in Montgomery County. And now that we're transferring to a hybrid and virtual model, we still wanna provide the best hybrid and virtual experience. But to do that, we also make sure that we have fun and rewarding things for the students. And this is something that we did to sort of lighten up the mood and have a fun moment. So sit back and enjoy it. Um, and uh, Mr. I'll tell you who won this in a minute. I did. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't know if the sound works. It might not. You all hear? Yep. So again, we wanna thank the board and the community for your time. And again, I'll say it over and over again, it's our goal to make sure that the fifth and sixth grade experience is the best in Montgomery County, whether it's virtual, hybrid, or a blend of both. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Dr. Marseille, do you want to introduce our next recognized person? Yes. Um, I'm really uh, happy to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Planarski. Um, and if I may, I'm going to uh, I was hoping to share my screen. Oh, I'm sorry. I just tried to share mine. That's okay. It's okay. Keep yours on. I'm fine. Oh, I, I had stop share. Um, I had a really pretty picture of you, and I was just going to um, probably make you embarrassed as uh, as I share <laughs> as I share this, um, as I talk about you. Um, so I am really happy to have uh, Dr. Panarski join us. Uh, today, and I know Mr. Fishbein, you, um, uh, you were talking about uh, uh, having um, members on the board who are the biggest cheerleaders uh, for, for Eastern. Um, and, it, uh, and we have not had uh, the director um, speak to us during my tenure um, in, in Cheltenham. And uh, I've had the opportunity uh, this year uh, though she started uh, March of uh, 2019, it seems uh, forever ago. Um, and um, I have the pleasure of being uh, the superintendent of record um, for, uh, for Eastern. Um, it's more than just uh, additional meetings, though it is. Um, uh, but for me, it is really an opportunity, though I'm part of the sending uh, districts, uh, to really roll up my sleeves and, and get into the inner workings and the decisions we make and how it impacts all of um, our sending districts. And I have to tell you that, um, and I say this and I know um, others can uh, attest to this and Mr. Bedell Williams can, but I absolutely enjoy working with Dr. Panarski. Um, she is an absolute visionary. Um, we talk um, three times minimum uh, a week uh, just to check up, see how things are going um, in preparation for, um, for other uh, AOC or JOC meetings as well. Uh, she comes in with a tremendous amount of energy and the short amount of time that she's been here, um, you can see the transformation um, happening um, at Eastern with the way in which she is innovative and collaborative. So I thought it would be a great opportunity uh, for her to come in and, and really share um, what the board already knows, but um, hear it from her with um, what Eastern offers, what that means to our students and the wonderful things that are coming out of the, the program. It gives our parents um, and those who are on uh, an opportunity uh, to hear uh, from, from her, though I know our, our families hear from her who are part of Eastern through her communications, but thought it would be a good opportunity to give her 15 minutes just to talk about Eastern and the things that are going on and what she's looking forward to. So with that, I'll stop sharing uh, my screen um, and, and Doc, you can, uh, uh, you can take over. Okay. Did you still wanna mess this up? Um, thank you so much for the, the warm introduction. It was a nice um, segue. I was a little bit nervous about following Mr. Wallace. Like that was such an outstanding presentation. You didn't warn me. <laughs> You'll be fine. Okay, so uh, first of all, I'd like, like to wish everyone a happy school directors month. Uh, that is January and I appreciate the service that you give to Sheldham and by extension, our Eastern community also. I can imagine it's, it's tough enough to be a board member to meet the needs of the community, but during a year of a pandemic, um, has to have been particularly challenging for everyone in this room. So I want to thank you for your service. And I also want to thank Dr. Marseille <clears throat> for his continued support and Mr. Um, Charles Burdell Williams as our biggest cheerleader for Eastern. So Eastern Center for Arts and Technology is your technical school. We are an extension of your building. We serve nine districts um, from Abington, Bryn Athen, you guys, Sheltonham, Jenkintown, Lower Moreland, Springfield, Upper Dublin, Upper Moreland. And what some people don't realize about our school is that we also offer an adult practical nursing program um, and evening adult continuing education classes. 
So our practical nursing program produces approximately 100 uh, licensed practical nurses a year that go back into our community and serve our community in the healthcare field. We offer 15 secondary programs from allied health to automotive related programs, construction related programs, veterinary science. Our most popular programs have to be allied health, veterinary science, and, and cosmetology. Cosmetology is a two teacher program and it's typically full. I have to apologize in advance for my dog. Um, he came home from daycare really hyped up. And our newest program for this year is robotics and automated technology. So as we talk about Cheltenham School enrollment, I really feel like kids tell the best story about what's happening at a school. So I just want to highlight a couple of our, our graduates from Cheltenham. Uh, the first one being Kimmy um, Villaforte, and she was a 2020 graduate of our business and technology program. She's currently finishing her second semester at Montgomery County Community College, and she'll be transferring to Penn State, where she'll seek out a degree um, in social work. Our next graduate is before my time, but I hear she's amazing, Autumn Clark, and she works for Penn Medicine right now as an enrollment data processor. And then hot off the press today, and we'll, we'll actually be writing a press release on this student, <clears throat> Jacob Newlight was a um, 2018 graduate in our computer networking program, and he was one of 200 students who earned a scholarship <clears throat> from the Department of Defense to pursue cybersecurity. And what that meant for him was that his education at IUP was paid for and he got extra money to pay for books and to, to live off of. Um, in May, he will start a position with the Department of Defense as a cybersecurity specialist. I just wanna show that you know good things happen to kids who graduate from our school. And we like to think that they find their start, not just at Sheltonham, but with us as they clarify and pursue and explore their career goals. Uh, I just thought you might be interested to know <clears throat> how your 81 students um, enroll in our programs. The most popular program for Sheltonham students is cosmetology, followed by culinary arts. And then the third uh, most popular one is network and cybersecurity. But we have um, at least two students from Sheltonham in every single one of our, our programs. So this year has been an interesting year, despite the pandemic, despite the uncertainty of how we would start the school year, and despite having to um, complete our enrollment process online in a different way than we've ever done before, we had a record number of students entering our programs. And we ended, um, well, we started the year with, with 583 students. And unfortunately, there were still 77 students who remained waitlisted and were unable to gain entrance into our building. So as we talk and Dr. Marseille and I talk and the superintendents talk, we talk about the need to really expand our programming to make sure that we serve all students and, and no one gets left behind and left out of participating at Eastern. So this year we launched a new program, Robotics and Automated Technology. Um, you know, obviously like many schools, we implemented, implemented safety measures to reopen our school safely from hands-free um, fixtures within our bathrooms, to you know, signs for social distancing, increased ventilation, um, bipolar ionization in our air handlers. Um, we had an Eastern Cares package for kids when they came back to us in person on November 5th. Um, that included a water bottle that they could fill in our hands-free water filling station, <clears throat> a mask and a hand sanitizer with our Eastern Cares logo that was developed by a student in our community, our, um, our um, art program. So we started the school year virtually. And when we ran our virtual model, we were delivering uh, synchronous education, in-person live instruction every day uh, via um, Microsoft Teams. And that seemed to work really well for kids, even though it's particularly challenging to do that in a career and technical school, but they were face-to-face -face with an instructor for the first hour, at least of the, the, the two hour and 45 minute session. And then our teachers um, touched base with the kids at the end of the session, just to make sure they were on target and on point. And in between, they offered assistance. Um, we, we surveyed our families and our students to see how we were doing with our virtual model. And we received a lot of accolades, um, which quite frankly surprised us because you know people, um, kids who sign up for career and technical education come a lot of times for the hands-on experience. 
So November 5th, we started our hybrid model and we've had some periods of closure, um, one mandated by the Department of Health, the second one, uh, a decision by us to, to, to close a week after the winter break to make sure that we could come back safely. And this year, we've also developed a plan to expand allied health and that was approved by our joint operating committee last month. So we are officially doubling up on that program. So instead of only 30 students being able to gain entrance, um, 60 students will be able to gain entrance, which is great news because this year we had 26 students who were unable to get in. So just to talk about some newsworthy students uh, for this year, despite the pandemic, some good things are still happening for our kids. Um, we've got Kayla Marshall, who was featured a little bit earlier. She was our September student of the month, um, and she is our Congress Buddhist applicant, which means that if she's accepted, um, she'll be traveling overseas to engage in an apprenticeship in her field of study. We have Noah Cruz is in our protective services program. He participated in our Skills USA student leadership conference, and that's a, a Skills USA is our student organization that promotes technical and leadership skills in students. And when we send students, uh, usually the, the conference happens at a resort in the Poconos, which is always fun for kids. This year it was virtual, but it's, help, it's us helping to um, cultivate student leadership within our building. We have Ryan Russell um, from our commercial art program. She was a ho our holiday card design winner as featured on this slide. And she will be the first junior ever in that program to take the Adobe InDesign certification test. Um, she is rocking this world. And then we have Dan Fox. Um, our, our joint operating committee gave us approval early on in the school year to allow um, students who were ready to enter into the workforce and paid internships. Dan Fox is a Sheltonham student in our HVAC program, and he's interning at WM Henderson Incorporated Plumbing and Heating Cooling Services. And he's doing a fantastic job and really getting some really good real world experiences. So our new robotics program um, is, is our crown jewel for the year. And our students learn to design and build robotic devices, diagnose and repair the state of our equipment. Um, as you know, many things in manufacturing and other industries have become automated um, with advanced technology. And so students in this program can enter directly into the workforce to become assemblers or technicians or continue their education to be um, mechatronics technicians or go into engineering fields. It's a really nice foundation for whatever students um, want to pursue in that area. Our teacher that we hired is named uh, Chris Pisante. He came to us from two other technical schools. Um, so he's a wealth of teaching experience, which was perfect when you're planning instruction during a pandemic. And he's also assisted several career and technical high schools to develop similar programs in Pennsylvania and New York. Um, before entering into the teaching profession, he has a wealth of industry experience working on automated equipment, and he holds um, quite a few industry certifications related to that field of study, including a Siemens Level 1 instructor for which he earned um, and was trained in Germany. So one of the things that we pride ourselves on, it, it doesn't matter which program you choose at Eastern, we design our programs so that students have choices. They can enter directly into the workforce if that's their choice um, and family sustaining wages. Um, they can attain apprenticeships or pursue higher education. So rather than listening to you know, me talk and describe each of these um, pathways, I'm just gonna give you some examples of some of your graduates and how they've done this. Um, the way that our students can do this is we offer industry certifications in their fields of study. So if they're in construction, electrical, HVAC, um, it would be highly unlikely that they would graduate without an OSHA certification. Um, our cosmetology students earn their State Board of Cosmetology license. Um, our culinary program earns ServSafe, HVAC, EPA, refrigerant. And these are just a couple of the certifications that we offer. Most of our programs offer multiple certifications and we like to make sure our students graduate with at least one, but we always aim higher than that. So our students get technical training from us, they earn industry certifications, and through our programs, they are eligible to earn advanced standing if they pursue their career field at different post-secondary institutions. Um, it's usually up to nine free college credits um, that help them make their, their post-secondary education uh, finish a little bit quicker. In addition to offering articulation agreements, some of our programs actually offer dual enrollment through Montgomery County Community College. 
Allied Health offers three credits in medical terminology. Business and technology professional students can earn nine credits. And our networking and cybersecurity students graduate with 12 credits in that field of study before they graduate. And these are all transferable credits. So an example of um, someone entering directly into the workforce. I know you've seen this, this last name earlier in the presentation. Um, we have a family of foxes that have gone through our, our school and we're quite proud of them. Fred Fox graduated from our school in 2017 in our electrical technology program. He was selected by Airmark, who was our um, facility management company at the time, uh, to, to get an internship for a year and then was offered a permanent position. And then we stole him back and we hired him this year as our maintenance technician in our facility. And he's doing an outstanding job. Yeah, we like to hire Sheltonham graduates, just so you know. Uh, the next graduate that we ended up hiring um, is Victoria Penicali, and she was in our collision repair program. She continued her education. Uh, this is an example of, of students continuing their education in their field of study. She went to Ohio Technical College, finished a two-year degree there. And then she worked at a brand's imaging in Philadelphia doing custom wraps on cars and then part-time at Mercedes-Benz doing rim repair and refinishing. And then we hired her to be an instructional aide in our collision repair and auto automotive program. And then a more recent graduate is Alyssa Johnson. She actually graduated a couple months after I started at Eastern and she was in our construction program. She was a student of the month. She was an outstanding student. Um, we were able to help her um, get a job at Clover Contracting, which gave her a paid apprenticeship, paid registered apprenticeship program. And she's in the process of doing that. When I spoke to her last year, she was so excited because she's actually getting paid to go to school, which not a lot of students can say that they get. So when she finishes that, she will become a journey person carpenter um, who builds, installs, and repairs structures. So, you know, the nice thing about apprenticeships and the one thing I love about apprenticeships is, is your training that you receive, you get paid to attend and participate in, but as you receive the training, you, you know exactly how that translates into increased income. So um, she will be making um, some really good money very soon. And then we have Kayla Marshall, who will be graduating this year. She was our September student of the month. She's in our business and technology professional um, program. And last year she was chosen by her teacher to, um, to shadow Governor Wolf's press secretary when he came to visit our school. We were able to, to get a shadowing experience and we quickly called the teacher and said, who, who would benefit the most from it? Kayla showed up at the time, I didn't know her, but within 30 seconds of talking to her, I knew exactly why she was chosen because I've never met a student who is so sure about her career pathway. She's going through the business and technology program. She's going to get a college degree in business, and then she's going to open up her own um, restaurant or healthy food chain. She knows she wants to go and own some culinary um, establishments. So look out, be on the lookout for this student because she's going places. So future goals for Eastern, um, you know, continue expanding Allied Health to the two teacher program, and we'll start to look at other programs that have a historical wait list because there's nothing more depressing than seeing students miss out on the opportunity to explore and clarify their career goals and receive our technical training. Um, our big push, and it's been really hard in the pandemic, is to increase the placement of students in their chosen career paths, whether they go into college, seek out an apprenticeship, or continue their education. You know, our job does not end when we, they finish training with us. Our, our job ends when they are, they are placed where they're meant to be. Um, and then in 2022, we hope to launch a new program for the school and we're exploring some options. So this year has been, been challenging and we've had to find out new ways of doing everything, including um, recruiting students and giving students an opportunity to see and experience our school while not being in person. So uh, in February, our Career Expo would typically have our, our prospective students coming in to experience each program. We certainly can't do that with the number of students who come through. So we've designed some virtual options where they can meet the instructor, um, actually hear from current students, get their questions answered and see the program areas. And I think the most challenging thing we all have right now is how to operate in a virtual world without making it seem virtual by making it personal. We also designed some virtual tours 
um, so that students who are in, in lower grades who wanted to explore our school could. These are pre-recorded um, tours of our cluster areas and they're available on our website to, to parents and students. And then you can always visit us at our website, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and we have a bunch of YouTube videos at Eastern Center for Arts. And that concludes my presentation. So I just want to thank everyone for their time and answer any questions anyone may have. On board, does anyone, if you have a question for Ms. Polisnarski, Dr. Polisnarski, please um, raise your hand. Ms. Haywood, I see your hand raised. Yes, thank you so much for that presentation. I, I first wanted to thank uh, Mr. Wallace and Ms. Nelson for their presentation. Um, wanted them to know that Arthur is doing well in Paris and working on three murals, but I am thankful as his mom that he was given the opportunity to work on that mural and to present that mural at um, ET. But Dr. Plesnarski, um, always a pleasure to see you. I had the distinct pleasure um, to be at Eastern last year, just one time um, for the visit, well, actually twice. And another time, I think for Mr. Burdell Williams, who was not able to attend. And sorry, Mr. Burdell Williams, I ate your Christmas cookies. <laughs> but on a serious note, um, you know, it's always been a pleasure to come over to Eastern, um, to see all of the programming that goes on at Eastern, all of the thought that goes in in a given year in terms of adding even new programs like um, cybersecurity, which is really a rising area um, for students to get involved in. So that's really great to see. And I was just wondering if we could get a sneak peek into what you're thinking about for the 2022-23 offering, new offering? Well, um, before I started, the administrative team at Eastern had, had done a process called program discovery, which looked at high priority occupations and course offerings compared to, to what we offer. And two, two programs emerged from that program discovery. One of them was robotics and automated technology, which you know is near and dear to, to my heart. Um, because you know every it's everywhere now, right? Um, and it's it's transferable into other career fields like you know HVAC or electrical. It has all those different components, even automotive. Um, the other program that that rose to the surface was an exercise and sports science program. So that's something that we will be exploring um, the remainder of this school year. We've already had tentative discussions with our local Willow Grove YMCA because it's literally right down the road from us. And if there, if there was a bridge over the sewer plant, we could walk there in like a quarter of a mile. So um, they're very interested in, in, in helping us explore that program and even offering internships like we do for Allied Health. So that's all preliminary. So the process is that we'll, we'll form an occupational advisory committee. Um, we will look at labor market statistics. Um, we had already surveyed eighth graders um, last year to determine interest. So we know that there's student interest in the program, but we'll develop a presentation that will then go through the superintending group to make sure that's the direction that we want to go, then go to the joint operating committee for, for planning. So our, ca our capital plan that I'll be presenting to the joint operating committee tomorrow um, has maneuvered our, our capital plan so that we can clear out a space in our building for a new program so that we're, we're ready. So Great. yeah, it should be exciting. Yeah, thank you. I, I really, again, appreciate your presentation. It is incredible um, where students start and where they end up and knowing that they have a path through Eastern is a wonderful thing to see. So thank you for all the encouragement you give all the students who enter your doors. And thank you, Julie. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Haywood. Uh, Ms. Henry, you have your hand raised. Yes, um, I would like to one acknowledge just the great work that's being done over in East Eastern. Um, I have personal experience there. My daughter who graduated more than 20 years ago, I like to say, attended Eastern um, in high school. And um, you know, that her experience there was positive was so positive. And to continue to see um, the learning just evolve is is tremendous. I think it provides a really great robust experience for all of our students, no matter where their path is, to have those options to do the things that they love best. 
you know, and so it's, it's, there's nothing more important than being able to work in an environment um, to, you know, to have a path where what you're doing brings you happiness and 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 joy and satisfaction and i and eastern definitely provides that thank you so much for the presentation thank you for the kind words and i will uh thank you as well for taking your time out of your very busy schedule to grace us with your presence and share all the great work that's going on at eastern and i would be remiss if I didn't congratulate with Ms. Haywood on the fine work of her son <laughs> that was shown in the Elkins Park presentation. And uh, with that, we'll move on to the solicitor's report. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Blarsky. Hello, can you hear me okay? A little bit low. Is that better? Yes. Damn it! I just turned the freaking computer off. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. No problem. <laughs> I I turned the computer off. Um, okay. Uh, there is no. Um, there are no uh, sunshine announcements to make. Um, there have been no executive sessions since um, the last meeting. Uh, I did want to report that the EEOC has issued regulations regarding vaccinations of employees, which we will be following and advising the school district on when that issue becomes relevant. Okay, My report. Um, thank you, Mr. Roos. Moving on to the superintendent's report, Dr. Marseille. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Fishbein. Um, I'm gonna give a brief, uh, a brief report, but I do have a couple of slides that I'm gonna go uh, quickly uh, through. Um, if I can. Uh, share my screen, give me a second. I uh, hope everyone can, uh, uh, can see that. Um, I uh, want to touch up on a couple of things that we're going that I'm going to discuss, um, and hopefully I'll be brief um, during my report. Uh, a number of things have been taking place uh, throughout the week and moving uh, moving forward, um, uh, and I want to touch up on some of these topics, um, especially events of January 6. Um, what uh, January 11th looked like for us. Um, some big shifts that were taking place, our town hall meetings, reminder of our MLK day of service, though it looks significantly different. We still honor uh, the legacy and the work of Martin Luther King, Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King, uh, share a couple of updates and then um, share a little bit of what we know. And I know Mr. Roos made reference to that in terms of vaccinations and where that is and uh, the work uh, that um, Dr. Horsey and her team uh, are doing to give us information about that and Mrs. Nab and Mrs. Dunlap as well. Um, but with that, I, I wanna say that um, the images of January 6 continue to sear um, in our, our minds and in, in our hearts. And um, there is so much to unpack. Um, with those particular events. And it's been uh, such a challenging 2019-20 uh, and then heading into uh, the 21 uh, year. And I, I, and Mr. Uh, Wallace brought this up and I have to say that, and I know when I speak from this lens, I'm extremely biased because of the chair that I, I occupy. Um, I really don't think, and I, know that there are times where our educators are extremely nervous about engaging in these conversations. I, and I think they underestimate um, their ability and um, the amount of professional learning experiences that we provided uh, for them to, at a drop of a dime, be ready to pivot and uh, provide brave spaces um, for conversations to, um, to take place. Um, and they did a wonderful job and 
uh, and creating that experience to allow students to talk, to share, to think through, to problem solve. Um, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, maybe saying what some of us um, uh, normally say, and it's okay. We don't have the answers um, right now. Um, and I know that uh, my communication may have uh, ruffled some feathers. Well, I know it did. I, I know the comments that I received. Um, but I appreciate those who sent me those comments, regardless on what side you are on. Um, um, and that's a challenge into itself because there really shouldn't be no sides if you, if you think about it. Um, but that continues to play out um, in the hearts and minds of this country. Uh, inevitably, it continues to play in the hearts and minds of our staff uh, and our students. So it's not a one and done uh, conversation when these things happen. Um, it'd be extremely negligent uh, on my part in terms of where I sit um, and the role and the privilege we have with educating children not engaging in these conversations. And we're not talking about taking sides, we're talking about helping students unpack um, what it is they're seeing, what it is they're feeling, uh, and providing a level of, of comfort if we can do that. Uh, so that will continue to play itself out. And that's why this work um, is uh, on cultural proficiency and equity uh, is so uh, is so important, uh, and so much of the leadership that our students are taking, um, who are uh, social activists, who are agents of change, who are looking for their legislators to better understand um, what is happening and how they can be a better service. And I know uh, Cheltenham students are at the front lines, um, helping to inform and galvanize and think through these critical um, these critical challenges. I um, want to talk about uh, yesterday. You know, yesterday was a was a milestone for for the district. It's the first time in oh in a very very long time, ten months plus, that we really had um, all not all but our some of our staff members um, and our students um, who are receiving in person instruction uh, arrive at the same time, scattered throughout our our seven buildings. Um, and as you know, our students who um, are special needs students and students who need additional supports um, have been receiving uh, instruction. Um, so that's not new, but what is new is that January 11th began the staggered um, schedule where principals have created a schedule that starts to bring staff in uh, throughout the weeks and allowing them to begin to get uh, familiar with the building um, we have, we had an opportunity and our administrators uh, had an opportunity to make sure that they were there uh, trying to answer as many questions as we possibly can, helping them on that first day. And obviously today's day two of that, of that process. Um, we also deployed our new uh, Qualtrics COVID-19 monitoring screener for those who are in our administration building and facility staff. That's our first phase of that, that rollout. Things went uh, relatively well. Um, so I wanna, I wanna thank uh, members of the student services team, Dr. Horsey and others, uh, Ms. Jackson, everyone else who played a role um, in helping to push that out. There's been a number of meetings that um, the ed side, the operation side have sat in um, to help deploy this. Um, as we are learning through, we uh, adapt, we modify, we work with our partners, and we anticipate that um, what we are learning through the first two days, we are ready to uh, deploy that to our staff on the 19th, and then making plans for um, uh, providing professional learning experiences for our families to get familiar with, uh, with the program. Um, technology is robust. It has been. Uh, they've been uh, moving. Uh, if you want to talk about warp speed and really defining <laughs> warp speed, that's what they have been uh, doing. Um, so uh, as we are the last 12 days of really getting and fine tuning everything and putting final touches on our preparation for February 1st, we have a large shipment of 
of monitors that are coming in, as we heard from our teachers who wanted additional support as they um, will be in their classroom supporting students, but also then delivering that instruction virtually as well and wanting assistance with additional monitors. Those are in, we're getting those um, installed as quickly as we can. And then on top of that, uh, on Monday, we, um, we return to uh, winter practices after taking uh, some time. Uh, uh, and we started for the first uh, time our, um, our, our middle school, I believe, um, as, as, as well, and things are going well. And obviously the board um, wants some per periodic updates. So we're gonna make sure that we do that uh, for you in the, uh, in, in the coming weeks. Um, also wanna share with you our commitment to our town halls, uh, meaning that our principals um, have identified and have and uh, shared uh, times where um, our families are being asked, invited to attend um, uh, listening sessions, conversation sessions, where they will learn about um, the instructional model um, and how that's going to work, what the expectations are. Uh, I was happy that uh, some of our members of the team, administrative team, were also able to attend um, Mr. Taylor's presentation yesterday and his town hall uh, that um, I received uh, some comments on from community members and they um, enjoyed that presentation um, and thanked us for allowing me to do that. He's gonna do that again. And as many times as we believe we need to, um, uh, to support families in this process. What I do realize is that as we draw closer to the finish line, and I use the term finish line to represent obviously um, February 1st, which really is not a finish line. It's, uh, it's day one of a big transition. But as we get closer, we realize that naturally the level of anxiety rises. Um, uh, the questions come up, uh, they're furious um, uh, in terms of the veracity of the questions, not furious in a negative uh, perspective. Uh, but we're getting a lot of, there were a lot of questions uh, last night. Um, the CBK team um, handled those well within the time frame. They're going to develop a Q&A like many of our, like all of our principals uh, for questions that um, did not get answered, will get answered. And for those families who are asking um, for additional opportunities, some families asking for a smaller session uh, just between uh, them and uh, the leadership team to better understand that. And we are um, uh, more than gracious enough to, to accommodate that. Um, you'll see that um, the dates have been identified for those uh, large town hall meetings. There are some uh, additional smaller meetings taking place, but we wanted to make sure that the ones we call town halls uh, are, are clearly articulated and the principals are doing an outstanding job of communicating that. Uh, I know that came up and we are working really hard um, to make sure that everyone's aware of it. People are invited uh, to those, um, especially as, um, you know, when Mr. Wallace talks about engagement and that 99%, I'm going to tell you that does not happen by accident. So um, we are extending that line and we are reaching out to individuals, making sure that they're, um, they're able to, uh, that they're able to join us. Um, uh, and MLK Day of Service, um, you know, wow, would we love to have uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King here um, in light of the challenges we have been facing, but his legacy and his work lives on through, through others. So I'll give a real quick snapshot, um, though it's gonna look very different um, this calendar year, all of our buildings um, are engaged in um, in service and are creating opportunities for that to take place. So there are building level events that are taking place that information can be found on those building websites. Um, our legislators are having uh, uh, ongoing conversation uh, with regards to uh, MLK Day of Service. Um, Montgomery County Community College is having a big event, um, which I will be attending that, that evening. Uh, so um, it does not stop. It has not, even though I understand, obviously the conditions uh, are changing in the way we would normally like to do that. 
Uh, we have coming upcoming committee meetings uh, that we continue to encourage you to attend. Um, we love the participation that we're seeing in terms of individuals who are able to log on uh, into, uh, into our meetings. That's extremely important. Uh, I know that there are conversations for our next uh, legislative meeting to allow a different form of communication or engagement uh, that we're gonna work on and make sure that happens as well. I think it's the will of the board um, in terms of that process so that will also add to the engagement piece as, as well. So we encourage you to please um, keep those dates uh, in mind and, and join us uh, as we share important information. And then lastly, uh, I mentioned this, um, and actually Mr. Ruse made a, some reference to it. We are trying to keep track of uh, how we can uh, support and help uh, disseminate communication with regards to vaccination. Uh, as some people uh, know that uh, Pennsylvania um, has rolled out uh, a plan in terms of who is eligible to receive the vaccine. This, uh, this afternoon we met, and I say we in terms of the uh, Montgomery County Superintendents, uh, Dr. Rubin, Montgomery County Department of Health, and Dr. Arkush, and uh, talked to them or listened to them in terms of what's the latest update in the vaccine phase and the plan. Um, unfortunately, I have to tell you that though it's uh, dubbed as warp speed um, in terms of vaccination, um, it is not happening as quickly as we would have thought in terms of dispersing those particular vaccines uh, and they're behind schedule. Uh, so far, since the vaccines began uh, being deployed, um, uh, Pennsylvania has only uh, received 10,000. That is significantly less. Uh, than what was being anticipated, significantly less. And uh, a sense of frustration um, in terms of where we are. Uh, what I wanna share is that there is a, a, a plan, our, our nurses, uh, especially our, our nurse coordinators and, and um, lead nurses, Mrs. Nab and, and Kim Dumble have been working with Dr. Horsey um, to keep that information um, really at the front of their conversation so that when there is an opportunity for districts um, to talk about when the phases come. And part of that is we're currently in phase 1A. We're happy that some of our nurses were afforded the opportunity to get that vaccine. Uh, Dr. Arkush is cautiously optimistic um, with respects to by the end of January, um, making sure that we can quickly roll out the next phase, which would be our, um, our educators, uh, those who are uh, in our buildings uh, providing support for our students. That is paramount um, in, in terms of shifting the tide. And when we get that information, as we work with the, the IU and we work with the Department of Health, um, we will um, try to put together a scheduling that supports that as well for those individuals who um, uh, are, are willing and interested in, uh, in uh, taking the, the vaccine. Uh, so not happening as quickly as we would have thought. Um, the deployment is behind schedule, but we are trying to um, work um, with our medical providers and our agencies. And, and I'm glad for uh, Dr. Horsey's leadership in this area and keeping us up to speed with how we can do that when it arrives. Uh, with us as well and working with HR to make sure we create the conditions for our staff members um, um, when those um, uh, dates are identified uh, so that we can get um, the vaccine um, to as many people who are willing to take that. Uh, so with that, um, that is my uh, report um, for this month. Thank you, Dr. Marseille for that comprehensive report. Um, we next move to public comments on agenda Mr. items. Fishbein, Mr. Yes. Fishbein, excuse me. I have a question for Dr. Marseille. Oh, um, yes. Um, so this is, 
we're definitely beginning to move in the right direction. I went past my neighborhood elementary school today and there was a lot more activity there <clears throat> as we have staff and more students, as we have students and more staff beginning to return. My question to you is this, um, is our uh, boardroom, the large boardroom, uh, has that been looked at for what needs to be done for us to be uh, to meet in person following CDC guidelines? Um, let, let me tell you, uh, in terms of being looked at, we began preliminary conversations about uh, if we, uh, if and when, um, when we return to in-person instruction, what would have to happen with that boardroom is um, we would have to bring in a new set of furniture in order to accommodate the six foot distancing. So if you think about the long tables at the boardroom, instead of the U shape, um, the way it's designed, it would probably be a very similar shape, but it would be uh, somewhat of a square or uh, incomplete. And um, we would have board members six feet apart sitting next to each other. Um, we would have to shift where our um, uh, leadership team sits. Because if you recall, they sit on the left-hand side of the board meeting. They have to be six feet apart because they normally share a row of long tables. So we'd have to measure that out, push that across. Um, we also then would have to, um, and not that we, depending on the, the board topic, um, uh, put the chairs, we have to remove a significant number of the chairs, put them six feet apart um, in order to occupy that. We'd have to set um, guidelines in terms of once we reach capacity, we would inform individuals who are waiting um, that we would have to, uh, they would have to find another mechanism to join the meeting. We would have to rewire the microphones um, I have not talked to Mr. Barone about that process. I also would have to think about the, um, uh, the extent in which the cameras and how they pan out, considering we'll be so further apart in terms of that process. But we, um, since we know that was of interest, um, we are gathering information to share with the board about the potential logistics of, that, uh, of those meetings. Yeah, it, um, I, I, hope that, I hope that facilities and IT are starting to look at that and begin to figure some of those, answer some of those questions. Uh, we have our hybrid model reopening in just a couple weeks. And um, I would have to believe that when we go to uh, hybrid board meetings, that we can still use the Zoom Mr. Ingen, this is sort of out of order. This is not a time for deliberation about how we're going to be running our meetings in the future. Um, it, it isn't a question for Dr. Marseille. You're making a speech, and it's not appropriate for this point in the meeting. If you would like to have a board discussion where we can have deliberation about the appropriate way to have meetings going forward, we will put that on the agenda. It's not on tonight's agenda. So I'm gonna ask you to finish your comment. If you have a question that is beyond what you've already said, please ask it. Otherwise, please, um, I'll ask you, I'll move on to the next raised hand. Yep, I, I have a question. Uh, when can we expect to know more about that? And Mr. Fishbein, yeah, I am asking for a board discussion about this. We've got people going back into the buildings. I believe you're grandstanding now. I'm going to ask well. you not to, please. Yeah, I hear you, Joel. Okay. Okay. We, will get, we will get that information to the board. <clears throat> we know that's an interest, Thank and you. we're gathering that information as well. And we will will be prepared to share with you what um, our Montgomery County colleagues are doing and what they've learned from the models that they're currently in. So we'll do that. Uh, Ms. Lohman, you have your hand raised. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Fishbein. I, um, and thank you, Dr. Marseille for that update. I appreciate that information. Um, I wanted to do a, a quick thank you actually to com your communications team for, the, for pushing out the information about the town halls. Um, thank you to Mr. Kaufman and to Ms. Walker for doing that and for also putting them in the 
um, putting all the town halls in one place. I found that personally very useful. So I appreciate that. Um, I had a question about the town halls in terms of um, uh, sort of hybrid versus people who are going to stay 100% virtual. I saw that I think CE Cheltenham Elementary School is doing one town hall for hybrid and one for virtual. Um, are the other town halls going to address both models? Um, that was a decision by the principal to break that up okay. um, in terms of that process. But in the presentations, um, they do cover both um, with respect to that process. But I think what um, needs to be reminded is that, and I know it came up in Cedarbrook is um, the, the model that is new to some extent, right? Is the hybrid experience. We've been living the um, the remote experience um, for quite for quite some time in terms of that process. Um, so, if additional information um, needs to be gleaned from families about what additional things they need to know, we'll provide that. But we are encompassing this presentation to capture everything that we're doing with our experience. Okay, I appreciate that. And I, I have one personally that's coming up on on Wednesday. So I'll get to yeah. it tomorrow night anyway. So I'll get to see what that looks like. Um, and I saw actually that the high school in relationship to that is going to be doing um, kind of a virtual tour for students who are new to the building. And I was just wondering if um, the other schools are going to be doing something similar for students who are new to the building. The other schools are aware that students are going to be walking in and they're going to need some preview of what that could possibly look like so absolutely um in addition to that they're working on a on, on a video um that they've been putting together about what that experience will look like so they will do that okay thank you right i appreciate that that's all i have thank you thank you ms Lohman. um mr cohen you have your hand raised yes thank you dr Rose, for the update information in terms of the town halls, a few questions. One is, will they be recorded? Uh, yes, they are being recorded and they will be accessible to, uh, to families. Great, and my second question is, based on the town halls and information and questions that have come out of those, will there possibly be FAQs available for the community for people that don't watch the video of their town halls live? Yes, um, there are FAQs that are being produced. Last night was an example of that. Um, uh, Ms. Adicia Cohen Johnson, Ms. Byron, Mr. Byron, Ryan were in those sessions. They were reading um, the questions that were coming through the Q&A. They were answering those questions and any questions that were not um, uh, answered will follow up in a Q&A. Great, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Ms. Haywood, you have your hand raised. Um, yes, Mr. Fishbein. Um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Marseille, for that very comprehensive report as usual. Um, really glad to see that educators are part of the next phase for getting the vaccine. So thanks for sharing that. That was good to get that information out there. And as we, um, or as the teachers returned to the school buildings on, well, yesterday, it was great to see the cars in the parking lot at the high school. Um, and just was curious in terms of, do we have a sense of the number of teachers that will be returning or plan to return on February the 1st? Um, I will give you that uh, information um, by Friday. Uh, I have a meeting to confirm those uh, numbers um, as best as we can uh, tomorrow with Ms. Jackson. Um, but I also wanna say this, and I think um, in a previous meeting, um, uh, Mrs. Lohman brought this up and I, and I shared this is that it is going to be difficult um, to share with you what we believe can't be written in stone. Um, because at any moment, and I think the challenge, the biggest challenge that educators are facing and when the superintendents meet is really about staffing. Uh, and staffing drives everything. And staffing could shift a model, depending on that. You could have staff members who show up um, and are ready to go um and um decide that they want to move in a different direction and they go and speak to hr and say you know this is my last ditch effort i'm going to take this leave so we will get through um that finalized information and then we will share um we will share that with uh, with the board 
with the understanding that that number could shift. And that could mean that we do that. And um, in my conversation uh, yesterday with Dr. Smith, and she's going to emphasize this, um, uh, that uh, staffing is extremely pivotal in terms of how we move forward. Um, and we've been saying that for, for quite some time. And like I said earlier, as we get closer to um, this February 1st day, level of anxiety obviously continue to increase. Mm -hmm. What I did like and what I saw um, over the last two, today and yesterday is that um, surprisingly, as many people are anxious, are the people who are excited to be back. So it's good to see that in terms of that. And, you know, and that will probably shift as students begin to stagger on February 1st as well. Mm -hmm. So we'll get that information to you in a concise report um, and keep you updated on if and how those numbers shift. Uh, thank you, because I really do respect that these are very personal decisions that um, individuals have to make, um, and but do appreciate providing at least the opportunity for the teachers to be back in the building with a small number of students first to really kind of get used to being back in the building. So um, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Haywood. And you were the last person to have a hand raised. So we will move on to the next item on the agenda, which is public comments on agenda items only. We will be running this the same way we have for the last number of months. So that if you have a question, it will, you need to send it to CSD board meeting commit comments at Cheltenham.org. It's there in the blue. Emails are subject to a five minute limit. And we'll ask that you please include in the email your name and where you reside in the township. And then we will answer those questions if appropriate. So we're we're breaking now for 10 minutes. It's currently 810. We'll see you back at 820. Thank you. Thank you.
Mr. Fishbine, can you tell me if my sound is working? It is. Thank you. Joel, I only have one comment so far. Yeah, that's shocking. Okay, it's um, time to reconvene the meeting, 820. Mr. Roos, I think we only have one comment. Can you read it, please? Yes. Um, I know we actually now have three. We have uh, three. Yes, I noticed that. Okay, first is from Karen Chaffron Wincote. Please help me understand why the school board is unwilling to delay reopening a bit longer so that the staff can receive COVID vaccines. The COVID numbers in Monco have never been higher and educators are in the next priority group to be vaccinated. After all this community has sacrificed throughout the pandemic to keep each other safe, why throw caution to the wind at the 11th hour? Please delay reopening until we have an opportunity to receive vaccines. Next comment <clears throat> is from Lisa Bettman and Michael the Ritter uh, Glenside. We are parents of kindergarten and third grader at Glenside Elementary. I am writing for, to ask for consideration for some flexibility in our school's return to school plan. We were surprised and pleased to learn of a four day return to school option after it appeared that 50% of the kids at Glenside decided to do the virtual option. I'm not pleased to learn that this does not actually pertain to Glenside Elementary and that the classes are closer to 12, 13, and up to 15 kids per class. Given that closer to two thirds of Glenside kids decided to be roomies, I am suggesting parents should now be given the choice for the two or four day option. Logistically, this may allow for class sizes closer to 10 students or less and give kids a bit more wiggle room around their desks. I also believe that this is in the best interest of the teachers who most likely did not expect to manage a class size up to 15 kids when returning to school. Small cohort of students who are virtual now appear to be at a disadvantage with the end of the synchronous day being 12.30 p.m. 
uh, versus 120 and will have less access to their teachers for the asynchronous time at the end of the day. Having a smaller class size may allow better access to teachers for all of the kids, but especially the kids at home during the last part of the day. I'm also asking for consideration for flexibility for the kindergartners to leave at 140 versus 340 if they do not need extra assistance during the asynchronous time and do not require taking the bus home. The explanation was given at the town hall that quote, there would be a full school day end quote without a true rationale given as to why that needs to happen for kindergartners developmentally and during this pandemic year. Given the transition from virtual to school for potentially for four longer days, that no new instructional material will be taught during the asynchronous time and that the day itself is not normal with five and six year olds having to sit at their desks for most of it. I don't see the harm in allowing for this option. It may allow the teachers to give attention where it is needed most and help with managing a huge transition for the youngest students having to sit for so much of the day. Thank you. And Rebecca Cohn um, from Thank you, Josh and Rebecca Cohn. Um, Glenside. Um, we have two children in the district, a first and third grader at Glenside Elementary. We hope that you're doing well and want to start off by saying thank you for all that you're doing for our students. We have been so grateful to Cheltenham this year in their measured and responsible approach to this unusual year. As we approach the start of the hybrid model starting on February 1st, we have been engaging with our school and district updates as to what that will look like. We are sure that you are fielding many questions as we get closer to February 1st, and we appreciate your time in responding to our email. We have three questions we would like to address. Office hours. We did not see on the schedule where remote scholars will be given the same daily access to teacher office hours in the asynchronous afternoons, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, Friday. We think this needs to be addressed as this has been a keystone in the success of the remote model making sure that questions are answered as needed on a daily basis so that they don't fall behind. While the hybrid in-person is quote new end quote, it is important to reflect and communicate how the remote model will be upheld as well so that those scholars do not get lost in the shuffle. Again, this is most directed at Glenside as they have fewer zoomies and therefore the balance is off. Four day versus two day. Glenset has the highest number of students returning in person, higher than the 50% threshold the district proposed to disqualify for four-day hybrid, leading to a larger balance for the students at home, as well as in more crowded classrooms compared to the other elementary schools. We would like to suggest that Glenside families be given the flexibility to choose between a four-day and a two-day model. As the school has already prepared for all students in a four-day model, there would be no increase in supplies or transportation needs, as long as the family stayed with the same two days similar to what the survey had indicated would be the case from the beginning. The teachers would be able to plan accordingly and know what to what and who to expect. And hybrid later, as it stands, based on the reply to the survey, if a family made the decision to go virtual, they were locked into the decision for the remainder of the year. If the family selected the hybrid model, they have the option to revert to virtual at any time if they feel unsafe or uncomfortable, but are then held to that for the remainder of the year. They've already selected an interest in hybrid and the school has already prepared that for them to return in regards to transportation, food and space. It is not clear why that family would not be allowed to opt back into the hybrid model when they felt most comfortable. Thank you again. We appreciate all the moving pieces that this involves, but also feel very strongly that we need to advocate for our students when we see gaps that need to be filled. Josh and Becca Cohn. And that are all the comments. Thank you, Mr. Roos. Dr. Marseille, would you have responses I, now or do I you don't want to? Have, I don't have specific responses. Um, those questions could be uh, in an FAQ with the Glenside community um, by Mrs. Robinson. Um, with respects to the four day versus two day, um, as a district, we um, are staying with that model and will not create a condition where we have schools who are doing uh, very different uh, models. It, is extremely complex with regards to staffing as well. Um, the hybrid later, we were attempting to make sure that staffing, staffing is extremely key um, with respects to um, if individuals were identified a, a model, especially when you wanna go into a hybrid, it could change the dynamics of that particular classroom. So for example, this conversation about overcrowding, 
what I have shared or larger number of students in a classroom. Um, the guidelines are very clear. Um, this district has stood firm on we are in the classroom providing six feet. There are other districts who are playing around with that. That's up to them. Um, we put seats six feet apart. Depending on the square footage of that classroom, we can either get nine, 12, 15, 16. If those can be equally spaced at six feet, we are comfortable with the students in the classroom. The number is not a challenge uh, for us. Um, and with respects to the, uh, the, the instructional time and intervention time, I'd have to look closely at Glenn size model, hence why I will follow up with Mrs. Uh, uh, Robinson and get those uh, specifics to those families. Thank you, Dr. Marseille. Um, and there were no other questions that you have answers for now? Um, no, I will look through. Those were long, so I did not okay. go through. So I tried to pick out themes from those. Uh, from those. Um, and I know there were questions about off hours, which I have to go back and have Mrs. Uh, um, Mrs. Robinson address. I don't think that's a challenge for our other elementary schools. Um, that at least has not come up to my attention. And uh, I said before that the four days, two days, we're not going to a two day model. Um, and the hybrid later, I mentioned that it is significantly easier for the district to be able to shift and allow a parent to go to a remote learning experience versus the opposite direction. Cause that will cause some uh, potential for significant challenges with staffing. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, anything that remained unanswered will answer next month or in FAQs. That's that's a fair statement, right? That is a correct statement. Okay. And specifically uh, as it relates to that building as well. Okay. Well, um, just for I, I was there was one question that wasn't related to the Winco the at Glenside building. It, oh, it I'm was, sorry. Go ahead. Can you share that? I apologize. The the one from Ms. Shaffron from Winco. Can you share that with me, Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Roos? Again, what that uh, what that was? Yes. The question was from Ms. Shaffron Winco. Yes. Why is the school board want to ask why the school board couldn't delay reopening until the staff can receive COVID vaccines? Uh, well, you want to answer that, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the board and the administration, the, actually, the, the administration had recommended that that everyone return on January 11th and the board, uh, the majority of the board voted to um, push the students return back to February 1st and the the I think that we deliberated in public on that pretty elaborately um, so that meeting would be hard to summarize but um, I'll give it a shot the the, the thinking was that um, pushing it out as far as possible was preferable and the um, the reason we wanted to start then and not at some later date was that there was a feeling that our neighboring districts are all going back in some form of hybrid. Our students have had no in-person attendance at all, whereas many of our peers in, in, in the area have had students in buildings and we we consider the risk very seriously, but we also consider the, the burden on the students who don't get to be in person. And that was how we weighed the various risks and benefits so that we pushed it out as far as possible, but wanted to return to a, a hybrid model at some point. And that was that that that's my summary. If any board members would like to add to that or Dr. Marseille, if you would. If I could I'd Mr. welcome Fine. it. Sure. 
before the rest sure. of the board jump in if they'd like. Sure. It, um, even if we um, if we made a commitment that um, we would return upon the vaccination of employees, I don't know what that threshold would be. I don't know if that is mandatory. Every professional would have to get vaccinated and the legality of that process. Um, um, uh, whether we'd be satisfied with respects to individuals who do not desire to be vaccinated with, um, uh, with that process as well. So uh, I think there's a lot of logistics with respects to whether or not we can get everyone vaccinated in light of where we are, and I shared this in my update, with the deployment of the vaccine, um, they are woefully behind in terms of the way in which they're anticipating. I don't know <clears throat> if this new administration transitioning will be able to deliver what it is that it's proposing um, in terms of pushing out more, but there also is a challenge with there just not enough vaccines um, as, a, as a problem as, as well. And if we waited for that, I also caution that we, we may be, hopefully not, in this situation in the fall. Hopefully that's not the case and we navigate through that, but we could be in a hybrid model. Um, and um, as long as the six feet social distancing applies, we cannot get all of our students in the building all at the same time under those regulations. So that's also a, a logistical issue as well and some legalities in terms of vaccination and mandatory vaccination as well. So I wanted to add that comment um, to the community member who, who shared that question. Very good question. Yeah, I agree. Um, Mr. Schultz, did you have something to add? One thing to, one thing to add because, um, and I, I know it's an expression, but I, I think it's just worth addressing directly, which is the idea of that the district is throwing caution to the wind. Um, because it's very important to stress that this is not a return to the way things were let in, in before COVID. This is a return to a very cautious, very careful set of procedures that happen to involve an in-person learning component. Um, but I think part of the reason for, for making this shift is a weighing of the, the risks with the benefits of in-person learning, comparing it to um, our neighboring districts that have been in person in a hybrid model for quite some time, even, even today, as well as a change in guidance, and this was particularly meaningful to me, a change in guidance from the Pennsylvania Department of Health around whether to look at community spread versus, versus building spread. And the rationale there being is if you have a safe in-person set of processes, doesn't matter how dangerous the outside world is at that moment, because if you are following your procedures in the buildings, it may actually be ironically safer in the buildings than, than being at home. So I just wanted to, the, again, I, uh, I also really appreciated the question, but I wanna make sure that anyone listening understands that, that this isn't a return to the normal. This is a return to high, very heightened uh, safety procedures. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Thank you. Well said, Mr. Schultz. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that addition to the conversation. And um, Mr. Roos, there was a community member from Elkins Park who could not accomplish submitting the question through the email, and she put it into the Q&A, and I would uh, ask that you read it. Although she doesn't have her name. If you could please, Deborah, put your full name so we know who you are. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, I can answer that. Oh, does Mr. Bruce, you have to read the question. I'm sorry. Right. And you're on you're on mute, Mr. Bruce. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, no problem. The um, um, Deborah Gibbs, Elkins Park. My questions pertain to the high school. What is the protocol for communicating COVID statistics to the broader community? 
What is the plan for social distancing protocols in the hallways and common areas? Are there enough teachers to support the hybrid plan at the high school? Will the classrooms be cleaned and sanitized between classes? Uh, I'll, I'll take those, thank you. Um, um, we have been communicating um, COVID stats to the community. We shared that in public meetings. Um, we also have um, the early warning dashboard on our website that provides not only state data, but also um, uh, Montgomery County data, as well as Cheltenham data uh, as well. Uh, and as we have cases that impacting our work in the district, um, we will um, communicate with the Department of Health to determine where are the most effective ways to do that. Um, um, the protocols in the social distancing have been identified in our health and safety plan. Um, part of helping um, adults and students understand is, and we talked about this, I mean, even far back in April and May, um, how do you turn a naturally social event like education into a sterile environment where students have to consistently stay six feet apart from each other? Um, what we're realizing in the, what we've learned um, in the, uh, uh, the several months that we've had a small number of students in the building is that it is a big learning curve. And eventually our students and our staff will learn how to navigate that. Our building plans um, uh, identified the um, signage across the buildings that will help do that. We do have a cleaning protocol in place per our strategic plan, and we will follow the recommended CDC guidelines for cleaning uh, for cleaning classrooms and how often that they have to be cleaned. So that will we will not go below the CDC guidelines with respect to um, how often classrooms uh, should be cleaned. We are trying to get into them more than is what was is required to give individuals uh, a sense of of, of comfort, um, especially the high touch areas um, as well. Um, so we're confident in our plan and our ability to, uh, to deliver that. Thank you, Dr. Marseille. Um, and that concludes the question portion of the meeting. We will now move on to approval of the minutes. We have minutes for November 16th, 2020, November 23rd, 2020, December 8th, 2020. Do I have a motion to approve those minutes? So Mr. We'll, Co Mr. I'm sorry. Charles Bodell Williams moved. Mr. Cohen second. second. Mr. Cohen second. Um, I'll take it by voice vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Hearing none, the motion carries. The meeting, the minutes are approved. We'll move on to the president's report. And that'll start with uh, student representatives, Lisa Lamb and or Quincy Rhodes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Spine. I just have a few updates from our committees, um, our student council committees. Uh, would you like me to present it or should I just read it off the agenda? Yes. You can just read it, uh, Quincy. We don't. We're not going to show the screen. Okay. Yeah. Um. So first, our homeroom rep updates. So we're starting up homeroom reps, and despite us not having homerooms, we think it's beneficial, um, to have a committee that serves between the student body and the student council. So any Cheltenham High School students who are interested in that should email CheltenhamStuco at gmail.com or one of our sponsors, Mr. Fasuka at m Fistuka at Cheltenham.org or Mr. Nace at rnace at Cheltenham.org. Our press secretary report, uh, we started advertising beyond CHS as a, research, a resource, sorry, for all CHS students. Um, and just a recap of that, beyond CHS is a website created by alumni Lily and Vivek uh, to create a network of CHS alumni for current CHS students. 
our environmental and sustainability update. Um, we're looking to establish a committee for revising the curriculum. We're interested in gathering some students, teachers, parents, and administrators in order to have more of a community input on what should be taught regarding environmental and sustainability. And we hope to continue meeting with Dr. Marseille. So again, anyone interested should email the student council email or one of the sponsors, Mr. Vasuka or Coach Nace. Um, our civics and community engagement update, we're planning a showcase event of political and socially active clubs and organizations at the high school to highlight the work that they've been doing throughout uh, COVID. And finally, we have the dance and school spirit update. Uh, we're having an upcoming event, which is our Jeopardy night, and it's open to all CHS students. This event will be hosted on Friday, January 22nd at 7. Um, so please be on the lookout for any date changes on our Instagram, and the Instagram handle is at John Ham Stuco. And that's it. Thank you, Quincy. Appreciate your report and all the work that the student council is doing. Uh, you are you are doing great work and keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go, Quincy, since I have you um, and I want to formalize this, I know that um, your leadership team uh, has requested a meeting with the board president and, and vice president. I want to follow up on your request with regards to thinking differently about the role of student representatives on the board. Um, I know there was a conversation that started last year and we weren't sure of the desire to move forward with this leadership team, but you had indicated that there is still a strong commitment. So with that said, uh, I will work with um, uh, Mrs. Harding, my administrative assistant, um, and I'll work with um, um, Mr. Fishbein, board president, and Ms. Henry, vice president, to schedule a meeting um, with you, Quincy, and I'm assuming Lisa as well. All right, thank you. All right. Yeah, that's great. I, I welcome that opportunity. Thank you. Okay, moving on to approval of the treasurer's report. Do I have a motion? Move to approve Julie Haywood. Second. second. Second, Jennifer Lohman. First, Ms. Haywood. Second, Ms. Lohman. Take it by voice vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any, any opposed say nay. Hearing none, the treasurer's report is approved. And next we have a, what I expect will be a brief report from Mr. England on the Montgomery County Intermediate Unit. The Board of Directors of the Montgomery County Intermediate Unit has not met since the last school board meeting. Our next meeting will be on Wednesday, January 27th at 5.45 by Zoom. It is open to the public. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. England. Um, next, Eastern Center for Arts and Technology, Mr. Burdell Williams. Thank you, Mr. Fishbein. Uh, I guess I'll follow the, uh, the very awesome um, 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 presentation by Dr. Plesnarski with an update from the December 10th, 2020 Joint Operating Committee meeting. Uh, the Joint Operating Committee approved and acknowledged the terms of membership for the participating school, the nine participating school districts um, at including uh, the, the acknowledgement of the Abington representative, Cheltenham representative, who was myself, and the Jenkintown representative who were, uh, who were uh, approved by their boards to serve on the joint operating committee for a term starting on December, 20, de December of 2020 and, and ending on November of 2023. Uh, moving on, uh, the president and vice president uh, were both elected uh, with Dr. Art Levinowitz uh, and Miss Carolyn Riley uh, being elected and they will serve their one year term from December 9th, 2021 ending on December 8th, sorry, December 9th, 2020 <laughs> ending on December 8th, 
2021. Uh, the Joint Operating Committee also approved Eastern's website as the official re repository for all operating policies, um, as well as the adult school. Uh, after approval of minutes, we heard on items under the president's report uh, regarding the presidential scholar, uh, who I'd like to just share a little bit about. Um, so just briefly, uh, Greg De DeStefano, who you may have heard, uh, he's, he's also, I'm going to speak a little bit, I'll just share briefly that he was also the December student of the month at Eastern Center for Arts and Technology. Uh, Greg, uh, is a veterinary science. Uh, he's focusing on veterinary science at Eastern Center for Arts and Technology uh, and is moving forward nationally to represent Pennsylvania uh, in the national uh, competition for the presidential scholarship. And uh, just to share about Greg as a December student of the month, uh, he's being recognized for his outstanding work in Eastern's veterinary science program. Uh, he's always had a love for animals and in particular family pets. Um, when he visited in 10th grade, he knew that the veterinary science program was perfect for him um, as he aspires to become a veterinarian and, and really work through and with his love for animals. Um, he's really proven to be a leader in veterinary science and was selected by the team leader as, 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 as by his instructor. Uh, Greg also participates in the Skills USA Leadership Conference, uh, where he achieved framework Skills USA Framework Certification, which helps students to understand what it takes to be career ready. Um, he also received the Statesman Assessment Award for his Skills USA Knowledge and Civil Awareness. Uh, you, we may be seeing uh, Greg on a school board or in a government environment near you very soon. Uh, it should also be noted that last May at the virtual awards night, Greg received the straight A award as well. Uh, at Abington, he is a member of the varsity golf team, student council and national honor society. Uh, as a junior, uh, he was also selected as an Abington senior high school student of the month. Uh, just one comment on that. Um, as mentioned previously, and as, as further exemplified by Dr. Plesnarski's a presentation earlier. Um, career and technical education is not that of an individual who wants to, you know, find a quote unquote alternate path. Um, I believe, strongly believe that the experiences afforded at the Eastern Center for Arts and Technology not only uh, affirm uh, some of the critical steps required in the work world, uh, but also really supports someone who's even looking to pursue uh, education in, 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 in college and beyond. Um, again, it's not an alternative education. It is uh, what I believe a supplement um, to the, the educational path that any student may choose. Uh, moving on, uh, the, in an effort to keep all students and staff safe, uh, Eastern has made the decision to reimagine the way that they provide the elementary and middle school tours for 2021 by uh, recording, uh, sorry, pre-recording tours uh, that were shared with all of the schools in the participating districts. Those videos can be found on uh, the Eastern Center for Arts and Technology Counselor Support webpage. Uh, additionally, as mentioned by Dr. Plesnarski, uh, the Allied Health Program uh, the board, the Joint Operating Committee, excuse me, did approve the Allied Health Program expansion. By adding a second teacher to the program, we'll be able to increase the capacity from 30 to 60 students starting in the 2021-2022 school year. Um, and it should be noted that the Allied Health Program is one of four programs at Eastern Center for Arts and Technology that is frequently waitlisted and it has been traditionally extremely difficult uh, for students to get an opportunity to participate in the allied health program uh, because of the, the important nature of the work that the allied health professionals are doing, um, obtaining enough um, uh, co-op experiences for those students was also very challenging. And so by expanding the programs, uh, we should be able to provide 30 additional students with uh, more experience in the allied health field. Uh, Eastern also uh, has 
uh, undertaken some capital plan re re uh, renovations. Um, we have authorized Breslin Architects uh, to develop plans for main office renovations to include layout reconfiguration, interior upgrades, ADA accessibility, and to secure uh, and for some secure entry improvements. Um, the replacement of those subject areas, uh, and, uh, in addition, the replacement of some exterior doors, I'm sorry. Uh, lastly, but what I think is ultimately extremely important is uh, there were some grants awarded and the JOC acknowledged the receipt of those grants. Uh, PDE announced the recipients of more than $9 million in competitive safe school targeted grants. Uh, these grants were awarded to schools to purchase safety and security related equipment. Eastern was selected to receive $25,000, which will be used to purchase the new security camera system uh, included in the renovations previously mentioned. In addition, uh, PDE announced that it is awarding competitive grants to 32 career and technical centers across the states, as well as area vocational technical education schools. And the purpose of this grant uh, was to focus uh, on uh, the purchase of new equipment aligned to training students in high demand occupations. And the amount of that award receipt was $49,529. The next meeting for the Eastern Center for Arts and Technology is tomorrow, January 13th at 8 p.m. via Zoom. And the link can be found at eastech.org. Thank you, and that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Burdell Williams. We're moving on to committee reports, financial affairs, Mr. Schultz. Thank you. Excuse me one second, Mr. Fishbein. Uh, Mr. Burdell Williams, could you share with the board one of the uh, voting items that we'll be considering this evening as it relates to Eastern? Yes, I'm sorry, it was not on the agenda and my apologies as I was reading off my report, didn't see your comment, thank you. So yes, uh, one of the voting items on our agenda tonight is the Eastern Center for Arts and Technology budget for the 2021-2022 cycle. Um, two things that should be noted along with that budget. Um, the budget cycle for career and technical education, specifically for Eastern Center for Arts and Technology is different from that of our school district. So I don't want to confuse the community with the uh, latter conversation regarding our preliminary look at our budget for the 21, 2021, 2022 budget cycle. Um, so what the board will be uh, approving or voting to approve tonight is the official uh, 2021, 2022 operating budget for the Eastern Center for Arts and Technology. The second item of importance to mention there uh, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the efforts of the administration at the Eastern Center for Arts and Technology for continuing to provide the same and similar, and in some cases, greater programming experiences for our students while maintaining a flat budget increase. Uh, the amount that per pupil that the townships are expected to spend at the Eastern Center for Arts and Technology uh, is the same as it was for the prior two years. So this would be the third year in a row that Eastern has been able to execute uh, the high level programming for students around Eastern Montgomery County uh, without increasing uh, the cost to the sending districts. So there is a voting item and it didn't make its way onto the agenda. It, um, is there, do you have a motion? I'm sorry, I think it, um, we can take that um, under uh, financial affairs. Okay, is that where we'll see it? Okay. I think that's where we will see it. Because okay. we talked about that and I think Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Michaels had forwarded again that language. So we uh, think we're gonna put it there. Okay, Ms. Th that, that satisfies you, Ms. Haywood. We'll, uh get that in financial affairs? Oh yeah, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we didn't forget to have that as part of the agenda tonight. I, I yeah. appreciate that, thank you. I, I also appreciate the reminder, thank you. And that concludes okay. my report for the Eastern Center for Arts and Technology. Thank you, Mr. Burdell-Williams. Mr. Schultz, financial affairs. 
Thank you. And actually, before I give my report, insofar as there are action items that I will be reading, could those be emailed to me while I'm giving the report? I don't think I have received them, and I can read them out loud when, it, when the time comes. Or, or whoever is, if, if not me, that's fine. Um, but if me, I would like them. The Financial Affairs Committee meeting was held the evening of January 5th via Zoom, excuse me, via Zoom after our facilities meeting. After a roll call and approval of minutes, the board was presented with an update on the current year's budget. This year's budget um, has been very difficult due to the immense disruption provided by COVID. And as a reminder, uh, the budget that we are in right now was actually passed passed last year before the impacts of COVID were, were fully understood. So I, just for folks who aren't aware of the budget cycles, the year started after COVID in August and September, but the budget itself was passed several months before that. Um, so the projected expenses are a projection based on where we are today. Um, and the projected expenses are currently around $1.9 million lower than originally budgeted talk a little bit about the reasons presented. However, the projected local revenues have also decreased in terms of the projection by approximately 1 million. So the net effect of those two numbers is that our anticipated savings in this COVID year is around $900,000 um, compared to what we had budgeted. And these are projections. Uh, it's important to reiterate that a lot can change and surely will change between now and the end of the fiscal year. Um, some of the cost savings that have been realized to date, um, some are related to COVID and some are not. So for example, $187,000 um, of savings are due to debt refinancing, which is a, a fairly routine annual process. Um, there were $300,000 in lowered MCIU transportation costs, and that is due to COVID. Um, there is also a $1.2 million savings due to the uh, CEA, which is the teachers union contract, which was reopened um, due to COVID uh, and the teachers took a freeze. Um, there are also some possible savings in substitute and, and district, trans district level transportation, but um, that will depend on what happens over the rest of the year. The presentation also included a breakdown of revenues this year compared to last year at the same time. There were significant differences across every single category of revenue from local revenues to real estate transfer taxes to state and federal. Some of them were negative, meaning we collected less than we expected. Some of them were positive. For example, in the federal level, uh, the district received um, around $400,000 of CARES Act savings or CARES Act revenues to help pay for COVID expenses. Um, the presentation itself, I would urge the community to view it. I will not read off every number, um, but there's a slide that has a table that talks about all of those. The second agenda item was, an, uh, the final agenda item rather, was a presentation of the 2021-2022 preliminary budget. So that's next year's budget. This essentially serves as the first of several iterations of this budget. The proposed budget has the following revenue assumptions, um, a very modest, practically no change, a very modest decrease in assessed values for our township in property assessments of 0.0045% decrease, so minuscule. Um, a prop, uh, the, another assumption baked into this propo uh, proposed budget is a property tax increase uh, at the Act 1 index level, which is 3%, which would be uh, an increase of around $17.87 a month for the median home homeowner. Um, flatlined revenue for all other local revenues is anticipated uh, as part of this budget, which I should note is not standard. That's, that, is a, that is due to COVID. That's things like low, um, no, no increase in business sales, et cetera. One discussion of critical importance to Cheltenham residents and all residents of Pennsylvania is the risk, uh, the potential risk that state property tax relief funds may not be certified next year. I wanna bring this up now. Um, we'll learn more over time, um, but this is the home, this is known as the Homestead Act uh, where property owners or homeowners living in a primary residence receive comp, uh, compensation 
from Pennsylvania for a portion of their property taxes. That, that compensation comes in the form of actually a decreased property tax bill. The money goes directly to school districts. Um, and if that is not certified by the state legislature um, and executive branch, that would mean functionally a uh, significant change to your tax bill from, um, from Cheltenham. Uh, so I wanted to flag that now. Uh, personally, I would, I would recommend folks pay attention to it and potentially reach out to your state representatives um, to, to inquire about that. Federal revenue allocations from the second stimulus are unknown, but are, are um, on the radar as we're developing our budget. Regarding expenditures, there are still significant unknowns. The BEC contract, which is our, uh, our workers union, uh, expired as of June 30th, and that is still under negotiation. The charter school enrollment uh, in Cheltenham, among Cheltenham families, has increased during COVID. Um, it is unclear if the, that increase will be permanent or if uh, that, in, that will go back to normal levels, but it does represent, charter schools represent a significant financial liability for the district. Um, and then uh, unanticipated infrastructure repairs. And again, in the slides, there are, there's more uh, than what I'm listing. I'm just trying to read some of the highlights. The bottom line of the preliminary budget is a difference of nearly $3.9 million between revenues and, uh, and expenses, which is a gap that the board and administration uh, are, will be working over the coming months to decrease between now and June. Uh, and June is the point at which the final budget must be passed. The next Financial Affairs Committee meeting is February 2nd after the facilities meeting via Zoom. That concludes my report, but I believe there are several uh, agenda action items. And I believe I will be reading them, uh, but I can read the first one, which is on the screen, which is um, approval of settlement agreement and mutual release. The administration recommends the approval of the settlement agreement and mutual release as attached. Um, be, I, I'm sorry, there's two items on the screen and I'm not sure if I'm reading the correct one. <laughs> if Mr. Ruse or some, uh, somebody from administration could, could tell me which, which um, item I should be reading. I believe that's correct. They're both numbered one, but they're both correct. Okay, great. Then you, you, uh, you, I, I, I believe we need a motion. Yeah. So moved. Thank you. I second that, Julie Hayward. Um, and I honestly, I'm never sure if the chair reporting is supposed to run this or the board president is supposed to run this, but I'll just say, uh, Joel, if, <laughs> why don't well, you? Well, it's actually the, the, the chair of the committee who's reporting on the, that committee is the one who asks for this vote. So thank you. you. Then thank yeah. you for that clarification. Then You're I will welcome. say all in favor. I'm sorry, uh, I, have a, I have a question. I have a question. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Cohen. I forgot yeah, to that's, that. You do say any board questions before calling. <laughs> any, them. Is there any board questions? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, for people that are not familiar with this, can there be a little bit of context given in terms of the dollar amount and what this is actually for, please? I would ask that administration provide that. Um, I could I could make an attempt, but I don't want to skirt the line of what is and is not confidential. With respect to the settlement agreement? Correct. I Perhaps. would defer to Mr. Roos. Yeah. Um, there's really nothing. The settlement agreement itself is going to be a document that's available for the public. There's nothing confidential about it. Right, so well, I think I want to hear the right. number in terms of that process. Brent, I'm sorry, so my, my request is if there can just be a brief summary for the public about the dollar amount and, and the purposes for what this is for, um, I would welcome that, please. Thank you. And request that. I can't open it. I would do it, but I can't open it. It's not opening on my screen. Uh, Mr. Bruce, can you open that? I can't open. I, I, I will. I will. Uh, attempt to do so. Um, I have I have it open. It's it, the title, Mr. Roos, is settlement agreement and mutual releases. Is that correct? Uh, yes. But let me. Why don't you give me a chance to open it? Absolutely. Um, so that just in case there was anything put in in terms of that isn't meant to be. Let me just. 
you can you could did you already move forward with the vote on the preliminary budget um I, I i'll i'll i can move back to that vote we have a motion and a second on the table so if there's a motion to uh <laughs> i guess if the folks who motioned that are comfortable removing their motions and we can come back to it is that we can we can, i i would move to table the vote on that motion until we get further information and we can handle other business that's the motion okay do i have a second on that motion second, second. mr cohen okay thank you I don't know if that needs a vote because I haven't read the parliamentary procedures does. recently enough, but uh, it does not. It's just a motion to great. table. You can okay. so then uh, the I am seeking a motion for um, approval to advertise the preliminary budget, which I was discussing was presented to the public last week, um, but has not been fully presented. So approval to advertise the preliminary budget for 2021-2022. The Financial Affairs Committee recommends that the administration be authorized to approve the advertisement for the preliminary budget showing estimated expenditures for school year beginning July 1st, 2021. So moved, Bill England. Thank you, Mr. England. Is there a second? Second, Joel Fishbein. And is there any board comment? Um, again, Mr. Cohen, um, can we just get information and the public about um, either a specific date or the time frame? Um, by which this will be voted upon, the actual preliminary budget. Recognize now we're talking about just advertising it. That way the community can know more about the process and the time period they might have to review the preliminary budget. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, I will give a brief overview. And this presentation, the financial affairs presentation where, where this timeline is discussed for anyone who is more of a visual learner, is on board docs um, and you can access it. It's a PDF attached to the meeting itself. Um, this January 12th is when we would approve the resolution authorizing display and advertising. January 20th would be the deadline for the preliminary budget um, being available for public inspection, which is at least 20 days prior to adoption. So January 28th would be published of notice of intent to adopt, which is at least 10, 10 days prior to the adoption. And then February 2nd would be an overview of the budget at the Financial Affairs Committee meeting. So members of the public are invited to attend the February 2nd Financial Affairs Committee meeting to learn more about, um, about the budget and ask questions. And then February 9th would be a legislative meeting um, where approval of tax collector, um, where I'm sorry, adoption of the preliminary budget. That's February 9th. I want to stress, though, that adoption of the preliminary budget is not the same as adoption of the budget. The preliminary budget is truly preliminary. And the fact that it's adopted February 9th, which is um, several months before the adoption of the final budget, the final budget is adopted on June 1st. So the short answer is, Mr. Cohen, and to the public who may be interested, in one month, there will be a motion to adopt the preliminary budget. And in, the pre, in, in three weeks, there will be a public financial affairs meeting, which is a, more of a public discussion about it. Um, and prior to that meeting, it will be available for inspection. Does that answer your question, Mr. Cohen? That, that does. And I, I greatly appreciate all the detail. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Um, any so other we... board comment or question? I have my hand raised, but it's, oh, more, so of a, it's <laughs> more of a general um, comment that we can Please do after the fine. two votes. So um, why don't we vote on the, the approval of the preliminary budget? And, uh, um, okay. Um, there's been, there's been there a are no other a comments then, um, and I see no other hands raised. All, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Correct. It's oh. just to advertise the preliminary budget, not to adopt it. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Right. Is there any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. Um, okay. And now we can move to Mr. Roos to, to explain a little bit more detail about the settlement agreement that we were asked to approve. Yes. Um, pleased to bring before the board for approval a settlement agreement that resolves the disputes that arose out of uh, the Cedarbrook construction 
with uh, respect to um, a subcontractor um, known as Diplomat, subcontractor of Borough Constructions. The total settlement payment will be 360,000. However, the district is paying 175,000. The insurance company is paying, uh, insurance company is paying 145,000 and Borough itself is paying 40,000. And that's what is uh, before this will, obviously a total release and settlement of all claims relating to that litigation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, procedurally, do we need to um, an, another motion, Mr. Roos? Yes. We tabled? Okay. Second and then so, um, I would like a motion to approve uh, the settlement agreement and mutual release as, as just described by Mr. Roos. So moved, Jennifer Lohman. Thank you, Ms. Second, Lohman. Ms. Pender. And thank you, Mr. Pender. Second. Is there any board comment? And seeing none, um, I'll take this by acclamation. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 And any opposed? Hearing none, I believe the motion passes unanimously. And there is a third, uh, third action item, which is the previously mentioned approval of Eastern Center for Arts and Technology 2021-2022 operating budget. The administration recommends adoption of the 2021-2022 operating budget for the Eastern Center for Arts and Technology as approved by their board of directors in the amount of $10 million, 811,300, I'm sorry, $10,811,300 and a capital assessment of $550,000 with the Cheltenham School District secondary contribution of $1,280,076. The two hundred eighty thousand and seventy six dollars, with a, which is a decrease of seventy seven thousand three hundred and fifty three, or a five point seven percent decrease from 2020, 2021 and a capital assessment contribution of fifty thousand and sixty three dollars. I read that explicitly because it is not on the screen. I apologize for the soup. Uh, is there a motion? So move, Charles Burdell Williams. Second, Julie Haywood. Thank you, Mr. Burdell, Williams and Ms. Haywood. Um, is there any board question or comment? Comment. Mr. England. Thank you. I just want to thank Mr. Burdell Williams for whatever he did to reduce our rates, uh, our contribution this year. I know you're new on that board and uh, whatever, whatever you've done there. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, may I comment, please? Absolutely, Mr. Bedell Williams. Thank you. Uh, um, um, unfortunately, that's not my doing exclusively. Uh, the reason our uh, our contribution is lower is that we have, I believe, 14 fewer students participating at the Eastern Center for Arts and Technology as we did last school year. Again, can't take any credit for that at all, but uh, any of the other good work coming out of Eastern, I will gladly uh, patch on my chest uh, going mm -hmm. forward. Thank you. Uh, and I will just add, Mr. Burdell Williams, you, you, uh, I've learned a lot about Eastern through your reports and it's very exciting uh, what is going on there. And I don't usually have a chance to say anything after your reports, but um, here's a chance. So uh, seeing no other board comments, I don't believe there are any other hands. Mr. Fishbein, your hand is simply not lowered, correct? No, no, I have something to say oh, about I'm your sorry. report more generally, but after the voting is on the okay. motion. Yeah. Then in that case, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, the motion passes. Uh, that does conclude my report and Mr. Fishbein, um, I, I just have comment. You know, one thing about um, budgeting for state revenue, which is part of the preliminary budget, we're, we're, we're aware that contrary to our experience where our tax revenues are flat or slightly down, the states are down substantially. And um, there, I, I wonder, I'm just putting it out there that there may not be the kind of funds, funding of the 20% that we would typically count on for our budget from the state. So I just, it, it, it's worth noting 
for budgeting purposes. So that's all Thank I have. You, Mr. Yeah. Indeed, and and um, I think that's another opportunity to recommend to anybody listening. Please reach out to your representatives and voice your support for for state funding of school districts. Um, I think it will be very important for all of us in this community. All right, um, that really truly concludes mm -hmm. my report. Moving on to education affairs, um, Ms. Henry. So my report for the educational affairs um, is, is this. In March uh, 2020, learning changed forever in the United States and around the world. The pandemic forced us to think differently about learning and to find solutions to support the delivery um, of learning for our students. School closures due to the pandemic illuminated the need for the district to find technologies that could support learning in a remote environment. During the December 15th educational affairs meeting, the instructional technologies team provided a presentation on the instructional technologies that are being used to support remote and hybrid learning. In addition to shifting teaching and learning, there was a need to also shift the mindset of our students, teachers, and parents. As with any significant change, there are challenges. Some mechanisms to address those and support those challenges for our school community include professional learning, which was provided to support our staff. Devices were provided to families and students. A mobile scholars website was created and support was provided to parents to help them learn to navigate the virtual learning experience. Some of the uh, uh, technologies that were highlighted during the presentation were Google Classroom, which supports both asynchronous and synchronous learning, Canvas, which is a dynamic learning tool that, is all that was already being utilized in many of our classroom pre-pandemic. Google Meets is used by grades K through 12. It supports face-to-face -face synchronous learning and utilizes a variety of features to engage students during the learning experience. Smart Learning Suite is a flexible learning platform that utilizes interactive lessons, games, real-time feedback, collaborative workspaces, and a few other features. The presentation also highlighted additional tools that are available to support student learning and engagement. During this time frame, the district has also received written feedback that our instructional tools are high quality. While the instructional technology tools have enhanced the district's ability to support learning in the remote virtual environment, the use of these tools will continue as students begin to return to the buildings. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the instructional technology team who's done a fantastic job in supporting these technologies and the virtual learning model. And those, those names are who presented to us, um, Tom Cook, Tammy Flood, Kevin Murphy, and Lisa Rock. Our upcoming um, educational affairs meeting is Tuesday, January 19th. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Ms. Henry. Moving on to facilities. Thank you, Mr. Fishbein. Sorry, I didn't have my report. Uh, the facilities committee committee met on Tuesday, January 5th via Zoom. Uh, a few community members were in, in attendance as well as co-chairs Bill England and myself, Dr. Marseille, Mr. David Teasdale and other members of the administrative team as well as uh, our board. Uh, after roll call and approval of meeting minutes from the prior month's meeting, Mr. Teasdale shared a presentation focused on district-wide COVID-19 related facilities updates, building specific updates, a brief discussion on the next steps relative to the facilities condition assessment report, and a school dude update. Uh, Mr. Teasdale started the presentation by sharing district-wide district COVID-19 facility updates, 
first. Uh, he spoke and shared that the Aeromax HEPA filters have been installed in 100 high school classrooms with only the electrical connections for those units installed on the second floor remaining to be completed at the time of the meeting. Additionally, uh, the 50 additional Aeromax HEPA filter devices that were slated for Elkins Park School have also been installed and also approximately have still require electrical connection at this time. Uh, the efforts to connect these devices is ongoing and will be completed prior to the return of students on February 1st. Uh, just for the community's knowledge, uh, the Aeromax air purifiers are being installed to help meet or exceed the CDC recommended air changes of 15 cubic feet per minute. Uh, the units are designed to scrub the air in our classrooms of approximately 99.97% of the airborne particles and absorb odors and volatile organic compounds or VOCs. To add to the health and safety of our, sorry, in addition, to further add to the health and safety of our buildings. Uh, sneeze guards have been installed in high traffic areas. Hand dryers have been disabled and paper towel dispensers installed in their place. Hand sanitizer stations have been installed across all of the buildings and desks removed from the classrooms to allow for physical distancing in the classrooms have been repurposed and used in the cafeterias to provide a simpler way to hold lunch while maintaining a more efficient, uh, sorry, uh, while maintaining distancing and affording a more efficient cleaning. Uh, further updates at the high school include uh, continuing the paint projects throughout the corridors and offices. Uh, all of the gymnasium, I'm sorry, many of the gymnasium corridors have been completed and for the teachers and administrators and students who have started back with practices uh, within the last few days, uh, sorry, since yesterday, uh, they probably noticed the significant impact. I know I have the last time I saw pictures um, to this particular area. Uh, the gymnasium lights project uh, is on hold at this point in time until the district electrician has completed the work connecting the air purifiers at both the high school and uh, Elkins Park School. Uh, we may, you may note that at our last meeting, there was conversation about some extremely antiquated, what we believe to be original equipment, washer and dryers that service the pool area. Uh, those systems have been removed finally. And, uh, at the, the, the excitement of the, the athletic director and new units will be, or are being spec and expected to be installed. Uh, further uh, building updates uh, at Cedarbrook, uh, the gym floor was inspected for some lifting in the far corner. Uh, it was realized that some moisture is coming in from an overflow drain that may have caused uh, that lifting to occur. Uh, that, that damage is currently being assessed and the facilities department is working with the insurance company given the uh, brand new, essentially, uh, nature of that building. Um, the gym is, however, safe for play, given that this floor lifting is in the far corner, uh, away from, uh, close to a door, but away from where um, students will be uh, actively participating in physical activity. Uh, at Elkins Park, the air conditioning project, uh, as referenced, I know that means very little to us in the community right now in January. Uh, but I assure you, uh, once our students are back in school and things begin to warm up, they'll, they'll greatly appreciate uh, the installation of the air conditioning in all of the classrooms at Elkins Park. That project is 99% completed. I uh, believe Mr. Teasdale mentioned that there are just maybe three or four or five uh, ancillary spaces that are not classrooms uh, that have yet to have their uh, air conditioning completely installed, but all classrooms have been completed. Uh, there was no updates for Glenside or Cheltenham elementaries and that there are repairs on the boiler at Myers Elementary School that commenced last week. And I would expect to be completed before now that we have people back in the building. Uh, and the Wincote, Wincote Elementary did have, uh, as mentioned, a, another uh, leak uh, in the glycol return system. 
uh, and there is currently a proposal for the pipe repair uh, it being it, that's currently expected. Uh, however, there is some excavation work uh, that is uh, expected to commence prior to that proposal being released. Uh, the administration building will have some updated air conditioning uh, that will replace any units that were not operational. Uh, the next item that Mr. Teasdale shared was regarding the facilities condition assessment report. Uh, so the community may remember that the district uh, sought the, the services of Bureau Veritas to come out and execute the facilities condition assessment report uh, to really help us understand uh, what the uh, with a significant amount of foresight, what uh, potential costs may exist in uh, maintaining uh, our current facilities as they stand today. Uh, the recommendation from the facilities department is that they work with, uh, work to find and identify a company who specializes uh, in the management of design and construction of public projects uh, that would include capital planning. Uh, this, this actual project will use the facilities condition assessment report to inform uh, steps forward and to investigate opportunities and challenges to determine our, our best direction forward regarding the multi-year capital plan and any future projects that are on the uh, that could be or will be on the horizon uh, Lastly, there was a short school dude update. And the one item I wanna share of importance is that uh, one of the uh, very exciting uses for school dude is the ability to track preventative maintenance. So the community knows and understands that the majority of the buildings in our district are almost less than 10 years old. I think there's one of our new construction projects at Glenside that is a little more than 10 years old now. Uh, and that what is paramount to maintaining the quality of these buildings for years to come is an efficient and well-planned preventative maintenance program. Uh, the school do program with the help of the facilities condition assessment uh, now has all of our preventative maintenance tasks downloaded into the school do system that will provide administration with the ability to appropriately uh, schedule work in advance to ensure that our buildings uh, have a lasting, uh, op sorry, have the opportunity to last uh, for not only the lifetime of the building, but for the lifetime of uh, that particular piece of equipment. That concludes my report. The, let me find the next meeting, I'm sorry. Anyone else has that information? I, can pull it up. I believe it's the second, uh, February second, February second. Williams. Okay, thank you. Because I believe our uh, our next legislative meeting is on the ninth, so it's the week before. So yes, it is uh, February uh, February second. My apologies for not having that information available. You are correct, Dr. Marseille. Thank you to the facilities uh, committee meeting. It will be held on February Tuesday, February second via Zoom uh, prior to the Financial Affairs Committee meeting. And that concludes my report. Thank you. No apologies. You got uh, nine other team members who, uh, who got your back. I appreciate that. <laughs> Next, we'll hear from Liaison Group, Mr. Cohen. Yes, thank you. The Liaison Group has not met since the last board meeting. The next meeting is scheduled for January 25th at 8 o'clock. It's a public meeting and it will be held via Zoom. Thank you. And next on the agenda is policy committee. I believe that'll be Ms. Haywood. Thank you, Mr. Fishbein. Uh, the policy committee last met virtually via Zoom on Thursday, December the 10th at 8 a.m. In attendance for myself as co-chair of the meeting um, with co-chair Dan Schultz and board member Jenny, Jennifer Lohman, administrators and the solicitor in attendance. After roll call, the minutes of the November 12th, 2020 meeting were approved before the committee turned to old business. This evening, there are three policies that I will briefly review that will be presented for board adoption and several policies that are listed as first read policies 
with several listed for repeal due to renumbering, renaming, and consolidation. I'll start tonight with policy and AR 226 student searches. This policy is from 2017 and was updated to acknowledge the need for the district to establish regulations that respect the rights of students to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures while balancing our obligation to protect the health, safety, and well being of students and staff and promote an atmosphere conducive to learning. A related administrative regulation or AR to implement the policy in AR 226 um, was also reviewed and clarified that automobile searches are now covered in board policy 714, use of bicycles and automobiles. Policy 006 governing school board meetings was also updated to address the ability to conduct meetings virtually in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. This policy memorializes also previously adopted changes to the school code to the, allow the board to hold an executive session to discuss safety plans and clarify that informational board meetings like board retreats that include any deliberations um, must be public, publicly noticed. A related policy 007, remote attendance and participation in board meetings is new and was updated to address the ability of a board member to attend and participate in board meetings remotely, again, in light of um, the uh, COVID-19 and include specific guidelines for participating remotely. Policy 354 and 454 govern the policy for taking sabbatical leave. And this was also updated. With the consolidation of this policy, policy 454 is prevented, excuse me, presented this evening for repeal due to renumbering and consolidation. And as part of an ongoing plan to update our policies and clean up our policies, we've been really looking at ways to consolidate and renumber our policies to reduce redundancy. And so the following policies are subject to repeal this evening based on renumbering and consolidation. Um, and they include, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Reese, I know that you're sending me something in the chat. Yeah, I just wanted to be clear. These are not actually up for adoption. They were not on the agenda for first reading last month. These are up for first reading. Okay, I'm sorry. So those are all first read. There's no policies really then up for adoption this evening. Correct. They are, okay. these are all first read policies. Okay, so they, that was just, okay. That's in the, um, the agenda incorrectly. So all of those policies that are listed under policies for adoption are first read policies, meaning that they've gone to the committee the first time for review by the committee and are just being presented to the board this evening, but there'll be no action item that needs to be taken by the board. So again, the following um, policies are not subject to repeal this evening, but are just being presented this evening for subsequent repeal um, in, in, an, in a subsequent meeting based on renumbering and consolidation. And those include policy 253, request for evaluation for yeah. college, as the evaluation procedures for special education students is now included in other special education policies. Policy 434, 534 for, six, um, for sick leave was also up for repeal due to renumbering and consolidation because policy 334 would remain in place. And again, none of these are up for repeal this evening, but I'm just presenting them um, for board information. Policies 411 and 511, suspension and furlough. Um, this policy is now part of 354 due to renumbering, renaming, and consolidation. And actually that policy will be renumbered as policy 311 with the new title, reduction in staff. Policy 310 and 410, abolishing a position. Um, that content will be addressed in policy 311. Policy 418 and 518 penalties for tardiness. Again, this policy was renumbered and retitled 318 and titled now attendance expectations. Policy 417 and 517 disciplinary procedures will now be combined in policy 317 with the same title. 
and then policy 318, attendance expectations, uh, again, was presented as a first read during the last policy committee meeting. So again, all of the policies that are listed under policies for adoption are not really here for adoption. They're really first read policies, meaning they've been presented to the policy committee for the first time at the December meeting. We'll come back for the next meeting of the school, uh, the policy committee on Wednesday, January the 27th at 8 a.m. And that will be held virtually via Zoom and all members of the community are welcome to attend. That concludes my report, Mr. Fishbein. And thank, thank you. you for that clarification, Mr. Roos. And thank you, Ms. Haywood. Next on the agenda is communications. And Mr. Burdell Williams was completing his term as co-chair of that committee and he took copious notes so he will be reporting, even though he's not currently a co-chair of that committee, Mr. Burdell Williams. I appreciate the honor, Mr. Frisbon and Mr. <laughs> Loman. Thank you very much. Uh, the communication committee met on Thursday, December 17th via Zoom. Uh, there were a few community members present, uh, not as many as we had uh, experienced in, in previous meetings, but I'm going to safely assume that was because there were likely getting ready for the holiday season. Uh, those, those community members were in attendance as well as uh, co-chair Joel Fishbein and myself, Dr. Marseille, uh, Mr. Kevin Kaufman and uh, Mr. Chris Perrone. Uh, after roll call and approval of the meeting minutes uh, from the prior month, Mr. Kaufman shared a presentation focused on a school transition plan update, review of the previous month's reopening and COVID-19 related communications a presentation of the past month's social media and district communications analytics, a review of the excellent young alumni driven website beyond chs.com and a discussion about future board legislative and committee meetings being held in person versus continuing with video conferencing. Uh, Dr. Marseille actually led the uh, presentation that night, that evening uh, with a school transition plan update uh, where he initially shared comments around the district's instructional model registration form and the process employed to obtain the greatest possible response from families and then finished with a brief review of the ever popular township COVID-19 statistics. Uh, then Mr. Kaufman shared the past month's social media analytics which did reveal a slight drop in some areas that uh, the communications department believe was attributed to the nature of our posts being more informative in nature. For example, um, providing information about lunch distribution and uh, important uh, board meetings to attend. Uh, and this is given the lack of in-school activities due to uh, this strange thing called COVID-19, which many of us may have heard of so far. Uh, the presentation then moved on to a conversation focused on the goals of beyondchs.com. Uh, as mentioned by uh, Mr. Rhodes, our, uh, our uh, CHS student council representative, uh, that website as described from my perspective is, uh, was designed by uh, some young CHS alums who want to fill a void in connecting and communicating with current students on topics such as the high school and college experience to better prepare these matriculating students for current and future experiences. Uh, committee members and the administration were extremely excited and, and, and lauded the, these young alumni. Uh, their energy behind developing uh, such an intuitive tool, uh, I mean, it really showed some serious spirit and, and, and energy, and it was extremely exciting, uh, especially given that there were previous comments shared at, at past communications committee meetings regarding the need for our district to, uh, our district alumni to continue to drive um, their involvement in ongoing district activities, whether they still live in the area or not. Uh, and this is what we believe to be a really good step in the right direction. Uh, the, the communications department and the, and the tech, and our, sorry, our technology department from the perspective of Mr. Barone did cite that there were some safety and security uh, issues and some liability concerns 
uh, since the new site was really, uh, again, a grassroots effort by some CHS alums and there were some, some, some security, uh, let's say some, some very standard security concerns that uh, would need to be address, addressed uh, if the district were to get involved and to partner with, with this organization. Um, the committee will seek to engage the Beyond CHS group and the representatives from the Alumni Association in establishing uh, what the relationship will look like uh, as you know what how we could all collectively work toward the goals um, to support ourselves more broadly, um, meaning how can we utilize that tool to potentially grow uh, alumni involvement in current student life and provide a, a broader experience and a, a more fruitful opportunity uh, for our current students and who will become future alumni. Um, there were various pros and cons uh, that were discussed. Uh, sorry, moving on, the next topic uh, was the discussion regarding, again, a very brief discussion uh, regarding a, an idea behind moving the legislative and committee meetings to in person. Uh, there were some various pros and cons discussed, but uh, at the time being, those meetings will remain virtual. Uh, and the administration will continue to investigate ways in which to enhance Zoom's functionality and interactivity for future meetings. Uh, Dr. Marseille did also reference uh, some of the specifics around the uh, steps that the district has taken to uh, investigate this experience and the potential for this experience. And uh, we, welcome, we welcome any future conversation on the topic. Uh, the next communications committee meeting is scheduled for Thursday, January 28th at 7 p.m. via Zoom. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burdell Williams. Uh, next on the agenda is the legislative report, Ms. Haywood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fishbein. I'd first like to just start with saying Happy New Year to everyone. I think uh, this is our first legislative meeting of the new year. And um, I, I just thought of that. So happy new mm -hmm. year, everyone. It seems Thank like you. we've been in the month for quite some time, but uh, anyway, um, every month I share federal and state legislative updates um, with the community and the board that impact public education. And as a representative of the Montgomery County School Board Legislative Committee, we meet monthly um, virtually via Zoom to discuss proposed and adopted legislation and identify issues that may um, require or at least encourage our board and community to contact our elected officials about. Um, at the federal level, the latest federal relief package provides about $82 billion to education after the Federal Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act, a mouthful, was signed into law um, on December the 27th. Approximately $54 billion of that was earmarked for elementary and secondary education, and that will be distributed to states via Title I funding, with Pennsylvania's expected share to be around $2.2 billion. The second round of coronavirus funding is about four times more than we received under the initial CARES Act funding, but I want to stress it's far less than some of our, the earlier proposals that were presented last year and far less than what most school districts will need given the uncertainty of expenses that may be associated with opening in a hybrid model, in particular for Cheltenham. The funding stream follows the same structure as the CARES Act with a slightly expanded list of eligible items um, for which this money can be used. Just a few quick examples include activities to address the unique needs of low income students, children with disabilities, English language learners, racial and ethnic minorities, students experiencing homelessness, which unfortunately is on the a growing side, and including how to outreach and provide services to meet the needs of not just these students, but others and purchasing eligible technology for students as well. Um, as part of the CARES Act, CARES Act allocation, 
Um, we've been allocated $125,870 in funding. And due to the equitable services portion of the grant, the district was required to include $4,256 for 11 Chromebooks um, for presentation BVM and tour charter academy. With the remaining allocation, the district requested 93 air purifiers for EP and CHS. And Mr. Bordeaux Williams just talked about some of the air purifiers that we're, we're putting in place for um, reopening the schools um, in a hybrid model um, as of February 1st. This funding will help defray um, the cost of COVID-19 related cost when we return in a hybrid model. And even though there was an increase again in COVID relief funding, it does fall short of what K through 12 and higher education stakeholders insist they'll need to success successfully navigate the pandemic, again, with the uncertainties that are out there. Um, turning to the Department of Education at the federal level, with the election of President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, the federal government is identifying key cabinet positions and um, some of the key changes in leadership affecting um, education is with the Senate um, Education Committee with the resignation of Betsy DeVos at the head of the Federal Department of Education. Um, she resigned after the insurrection at the Capitol building last week. And with her departure, President-elect Biden has nominated Connecticut Education Commissioner Miguel Cordona to lead the department. Um, I know I personally look forward to Mr. Cordona's leadership, which will be in sharp contrast to the former Secretary of Education's lack of support or appropriate funding of public education. Um, at the state level, the State General Assembly convened on January the 5th, 5th to officially begin the 2021-22 legislative session. 30 new legislators took the oath of office for the first time, including six new senators and 25 new members of the House of Representatives, including our own state representative, um, Napoleon Nelson. As part of the new session, uh, Republican Democrat, Democrats chair, um, chairs of the House and Senate Education Committees have also been appointed. The House Education Committee will be chaired by Representative Kurt Sani, who's a Republican from Erie, and Minority um, Leader Representative Mark Longietti, who's a Democrat from Mercer County. Representative Nelson is also on the House Education Committee, and we really do look forward to working with him um, as we struggle through and face challenges um, with public ed um, education generally, uh, school funding and other issues. On the Senate side, it's expected that Senator Wayne Langerlock from uh, Republican from Cambria County will be reappointed as the chair of the Senate Education Committee and the Democratic chair has yet to be um, announced yet. So stay tuned, I'll bring that back. On February the 2nd, Governor Wolf will present his 2021-22 state budget proposal before a joint meeting of the state, state, excuse me, state Senate and House of Representatives. Um, we'll provide more information as that address becomes more publicly known in terms of how you can zoom into that um, public address as well. This is really critically important for us as a school district, as Mr. Fine indicated earlier. Um, while we get about 20% or in the past have been in getting about 20% in state funding from the state for public education, that amount is not guaranteed any particular year. In part, last year, the state faced a about $4 billion budget deficit. And while we received the same funding that we did the prior year, um, that may not be guaranteed again this year, depending on where they land with their budget. But while we appreciate the funding for at the state level, again, as Mr. Schultz had indicated, this is also an area of advocacy and contacting our representatives to make sure that in general public funding of, um, or state funding of public education is really adequate. Um, on the legislative side, the State Board of Education proposed changes to state regulations for certification of professional personnel um, some of the key changes include 
requiring teacher preparation programs to integrate professional ethics, cognitive competencies, um, structural literacy and culturally relevant and sustaining education, which we already do in our school district and very proud of that. There's also been a change in the transportation subsidy. Um, and so we'll get more information about the modifications that were made in that area as well um, as we go forward to calculate the pupil education transportation subsidy that will be allotted to us for the 2021 um, 2020 21 school year. Um, that concludes my report, Mr. Fishbein. Um, thank you. Thank you um, for that comprehensive report. We'll move on to administrative reports, Ms. Tolbert Jackson. Thank you. I'm submitting the following items for consent agenda. Um, number one, appointment of professional employees, A and B. Two, appointment of support staff, A and B. Three, approval of changes in assignment, A. Mm, there's one missing, so A and B. Four, approval of a position, A. Five, approval of agreement. Six, approval of leadership stipend positions, A and B. Seven, termination of classified employee. Eight, extra duty, extra pay. That's it for the consent agenda and I'm waiting for a vote. <laughs> Motion. So, so move. Approve. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Uh, Mr. Fishbein, can I just make one comment? Oh, absolutely. Board comment. <laughs> I forgot to say that. <laughs> Not ahead. a problem. I just want to point out that um, under the um, approval, I, Hmm. Approval of a position um, for A um, as it relates to approving a new administrative employee position uh, custodial supervisor. Uh, this was a request um, um, from administration to really look at this position as we move into a hybrid model um, and the schools reopen and in, in hopefully in February. Um, right now we did not have a, a supervisor at, the, um, at that level. Um, for the evening shift. This will allow um, a supervisor to be available to visit all the buildings during the evening shifts and also to ensure that the buildings are, you know, appropriately cleaned, um, particularly with the COVID-19 increased precautions and cleaning protocols that need to be put in place so that the, the classrooms and the schools are appropriately um, prepared for the staff and students the following days. So I wanted to point that out um, as sometimes we get questions about adding new positions at the administrative level. If I can add Mrs. Haywood that it also helps to support um, some operational items as well. Um, as you know, um, a lot of things happen in the evening um, and alarms go off, systems um, reboot, um, things are triggered and that allows the opportunity for someone on the ground to be able to address those as quickly as possible versus um, the challenge of uh, having to um, either um, go through the list of individuals. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't know my video was off. Um, going across uh, a list, because when an evening function happens, normally um, they have a list of administrators who they try to contact in order to address those. And um, uh, I'm on that list. Uh, Mr. Teasdale's on that list. Uh, Mr. Chinto's on that list. And um, I think this will help support um, those late night calls as well in terms of trying to address those as quickly as, uh, as possible. Any further board discussion? Or questions. 
Anything else, Ms. Haywood? No, nope. thank you, Mr. Okay. Thank you. So now it's time to vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. I want some cocoa. Hearing none, it, the, the, it, the positions are approved. And uh, moving on to your the rest of your report, Ms. Culver Jackson. Thank you. The following are informational items. One, retirements, A and B. Two, resignations, A through E. Three, non-discretionary leave of absence. A. Thank you. Thank you. And moving on to educational affairs, Dr. Smith. I'm sorry, Mr. before we go. Yeah. Oh. I'm sorry, Mr. England, you can go. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, I just wanted to point out that we have uh, two employees who are retiring. Do it. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. You beat me to it, exactly what I was going to say. So please go ahead, I'll echo what you're saying. <laughs> Mr. McMahon, uh, a maintenance mechanic with 30 and a half years uh, service in the school district. And uh, Ms. Klukowitz, a uh, kindergarten teacher uh, now at Myers, uh, 28 and a half years. And that is uh, just remarkable service. And, and I just wanted to give them a shout out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. England. I saw your hand raised. I'm sorry for neglecting to call on you. Ms. Haywood, your hand is raised also. Did you want to say something? No, I, I didn't lower my hand from before, but I definitely did owe what Mr. England shared. Yeah, and I will as well. Dr. Marseille, did you have something to add to that? Uh, I, just a third ditto to um, the astounding number of years of, of service. Um, you just uh, don't find that a lot, and uh, it's testimonial to uh, the work uh, that these individuals uh, have committed. Um, 28 years is a very long time uh, supporting our children. 30.5 years is a very long time. So we want to uh, thank both of them uh, and wish them luck in their, uh, in their transition. And they'll probably be getting a lot more sleep now uh, than uh, before. Thank Very you. good. Thank you. Okay, now we can move on to educational affairs, Dr. Smith. Good evening. I'm submitting the following as a consent agenda. One, approval of educational service agreement and two, approval of volunteers. Thank you. I have a motion. Motion to approve. Bill England. Do I have a second? Second, Jennifer Lohman. Do I have any board comment or questions? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Hearing none, both items are approved. And we can move on to financial affairs, Ms. Michaels. Thank you. I'm submitting the following as a consent agenda. One, approval of 20... 20, 2021 budget transfers A as submitted, two approval of payments A as listed, and three approval of Eastern Center for Arts and Technology 21 22 operating budget. I think we've already approved number three in the financial affairs report. Did My we apologies. Not? I didn't, was it listed under there? Yes, it wasn't listed. We did approve it um, because I it was in the email, so I may have read it at the wrong point. I apologize. I think it could have been in either, okay. and we confused it at the agenda build. So now here we are. Okay. It, it doesn't need to be voted on a second. Please disregard number three. Yeah. Okay. So moved. Do I have a second? Second, Charles Burdell Williams. And do I have any board questions or discussion? Seeing no raised hands, hearing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Hearing none, both items are approved. And it's now time for- Before we go into that, can I make oh, a comment? Absolutely. So I know this is the, the day that I was dreading um, and I've tried to 
stop all of you from making comments, um, especially Mr. Schultz, um, with respect to um, Mrs. Michaels, and this is officially her last legislative meeting. Um, and uh, I've been in multiple stages of denial, so I figured if I just don't talk about it, it may not be the case. So um, November 18th is will live in infamy with respects to the date that she shared uh, with us, um, her desire to, to, to transition. Um, and I just wanted to, um, without, um, I was going to embarrass her and put a PowerPoint presentation with all the pictures I have of her um, uh, during her work throughout the years that I've had the pleasure of knowing her. Thank uh, you for not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Both, uh, I'll do it at some other event. Um, I'll show it to you first so I can get permission. Um, both personally and professionally. And I have to say this, um, you know, um, Kara, and I call her by her first name. Normally I don't do that. Um, but she's given um, 11 years of outstanding service to this district. Uh, and I've said that uh, oftentimes in Cheltenham, uh, you, you can sometimes count those in dog years, right? So you can imagine uh, that, uh, that, that length of time. And during that time, I, I can speak to personally my five years when I arrived in the district in July 2015, but can attest to, based on those years, can attest to what she was doing before, even though I was not present. Um, during those 11 years, it's unequivocal that she has committed to ensuring that she does her part and her team uh, under her leadership in supporting the district's mission and vision. It's core values, a strategic plan, and uh, obviously our curriculum audit. Um, and she's done a lot in that time period. Uh, also, she's worn a lot of hats during that time period. So I was um, looking for tantalizing information in her employee file. Um, and I, I thought to myself, uh, Ms. Michaels has had more title changes than anybody I know, right? So she's from acting director of business affairs to assistant director of business affairs to director of business affairs to um, uh, director of business financial affairs to business manager. Um, but even without, regardless of those hats, um, she's been committed and she has stated over and over again um, about the district's need to make really tough decisions. And the mantra when I arrived though, when I came in um, and there was a tremendous amount of energy with respects to what needed to be done and reorganizations that need to take place in order to begin to lay the foundation for some of the work that we're doing now. But even with that, it's always been about, um, we need to control our expenditures and tough decisions have to be made. And throughout that time, um, she's worked um, to try to make sure that we are doing both. And that is managing the financial realities of the district and the community but also making sure that all of those individuals who come to her from operations to student services, to special education, to the, the entire educational office and the buildings um, that uh, we don't compromise uh, on our commitment to making sure that students um, are, are first and the needs of students uh, come first. Uh, even though that's been extremely uh, challenging. And uh, the math you can add by yourself, and it's clear that she has saved us millions of dollars in her ability to go back and look at the pennies that eventually turn to dollars and look at those heavy dollar items uh, as well. Um, so 
whether it is being extremely vigilant about collective bargaining agreements in terms of negotiations, whether it's um, uh, revisiting contracts or vendor agreements, whether it's uh, savings through attrition, through staffing, whether it's bond refinancing, whether it's technology and looking at new ways of refinancing or doing things, whether it is sustainability in terms of helping our operations department save money through there, um, she's, um, she's done it all. Um, and um, she's going to be missed. Um, we know that we continue to have challenges um, ahead of us uh, where, um, you know, she's proposed tough decisions that we had to make. Some were accepted, others were not. Um, and at the end of the day, some of those that were not, <laughs> they're gonna have to eventually be accepted uh, in terms of where we are. Um, uh, but I do want to, uh, on behalf of this administrative team um, and personally thank her um, for not just the 11 plus years of service to this district, um, but the five years that uh, she has um, oh, excuse me. Um, uh, in this role as, as superintendent. Um, the only saving grace in this uh, goodbye is that um, she's right across the railroad tracks. So um, she's not going to be too far away. So. Um, Kara, thank you so much for everything that you've done. Uh, you've put us in a definitely better place, uh, even though we're continuing to be challenged. It really is about not that, it's about doubling down on tougher decisions, and that is it. Uh, but you saved us a significant amount of dollars uh, under your leadership. Um, we built a lot of buildings to support the type of infrastructure we expect for our students and our staff. Uh, so we're eternally grateful and uh, uh, good luck. Thank you very much. Um, gonna miss you all. Um, it's a bittersweet goodbye. Um, so I'm not gonna get emotional, but thank you to everybody. Um, support has been amazing. And um, like Dr. Marseille said, I'll be right across the railroad tracks. I'll just note for members of the public that the board has said its goodbyes several times. Yes. <laughs> That's the only reason there's current board silence. Um, I will say goodbye one more time. Ms. Michaels, it's been a true pleasure getting to work with you um, and excited to watching you, uh, watching you continue to serve public schools and, uh, and enable the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Smith, you have your hand raised. Did you want to say something? Yes, I'll be brief and just um, on behalf of the Office of Education, thank Ms. Michaels for all that she has done, um, especially during my tenure to support the Office of Education, curriculum instruction, and um, everything that we've needed um, from a human resource perspective, as well as physical resources um, to keep things going in the district. So thank you very much, Karen. We wish you the very best. Thanks, Dr. Smith. Ms. Haywood. So Ms. Michaels, I know we've said our goodbyes before <laughs> as well, but I'm just going to pile on and say you definitely will be missed. Um, I'm, I'm going to really miss your candor um, and your practical approach. I think that that has been really important for us as a board to really understand fiscally where we are and where we need to be. And you really are sometimes taking us, pulling and struggling and everything there, but we really, I really appreciate um, all the information that you have brought to bear um, to the board. I think it's critically important that, you know, you've made a lot of information very transparent and easy and maybe easier to understand um, because the financial affairs meeting is one of the tougher meetings um, to get through, not because it's because it's more difficult in terms of making decisions, more difficult because some of the concepts are more difficult to grasp. Um, so I do appreciate over time, 
you really kind of um, making those more in plain English for the rest of us as well. You will definitely be missed. Um, and I definitely wish you very well in your new endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for those signs. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Haywood. Mr. Burdell Williams, you have your hand up. Yep, I just want to take the opportunity to thank you, Kara, and also to give the community the opportunity to look at my ridiculously bad handwriting. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's the best way that I could uh, I could thank you, Kara, publicly. Um, I think. Right, I think we, we, we started out on a really good note uh, when I was a community member, uh, just you know, with all of my numerous questions and I appreciate you for, uh, for being so thorough and answering my questions, even at the late hour that some of those meetings were ending and uh, wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Burdell, you're putting up signs. <laughs> All right, let's not drag this on before there's tears in this. Um... Mr. Cohen, I was muted myself. Can Do you have uh, anything to add to the comments? Thanks. Um, I, I will be brief. I also want to thank Kara. wish her the best and, and thank her um, for the hard work that she did on real estate assessments. It was a pleasure working with you and I wish you the best. Right. Thank you. Good point. Good point. And uh, as a uh, Current president of the board, I'll add my thanks. Uh, you've been, you've, you've gotten us educated and taken us through some pretty difficult times, and we very much appreciate it. Wish you luck in your next endeavors. Thank you again. You're welcome. So now I think we are at the um, public comment on non-agenda items portion of the meeting. This will be done the same way the public comments on agenda items were done. It's only a five minute break for you to type your questions to CSD board meeting comments at cheltenham.org and we will answer them now or and make sure you put your name, full name and where you live in the township and we will answer them or answer them at a later meeting. Um, so we will take this break starting at 1014. We'll see you back at 1019.
you can see pictures of the soap up from the movie, from my survey window. Okay, you guys responded fairly quickly. Mr. Cohn, just so you know, you're not muted. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we're ready to go back on. We have one question that came in through the email. Mr. Bruce, if you wanna get back on, are you on? Yes, I am. Could you hear me all right? I can. Okay, uh, Lewis Reyes of Glenside. <clears throat> I have many concerns about the board's decision to move to a hybrid model on February 1st and I'm left with many questions that I would appreciate the board answering. My concerns can be summarized in these 10 comments and questions. One, Montgomery County's new cases fluctuate but are still extremely high. There is a new more contagious variant of COVID-19 that has reached Pennsylvania. We seem to be increasingly close to more people getting vaccinated. It does not make sense to me why the board has chosen this moment to move to hybrid we have waited this long. Why is there now a sudden push to go to hybrid? For Dr. Levin's update last week, the Pennsylvania Department of Health is advising that middle and high school stay remote. Two, why does the board continue to meet virtually while they have decided to send hundreds of students and staff back into the district's buildings? Thank you, Mr. England, for raising this question earlier in tonight's meeting. Three, what threshold is the board operating off of that determined that it was time to move to a hybrid model? Four, what metric or threshold has been established for determining if, when it is too unsafe to remain hybrid and the district should move back to a fully virtual model? What is the plan if that occurs? Five, according to Mr. Fishbein's comment earlier this evening, it seems that the board felt pressure to move to hybrid based on other districts' decision to do so. Why is the board using neighboring districts to make decisions for our district? Feltonham has many differences to other districts in the county. The population of our district is majority black. We have seen COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted black and brown communities across the nation. I moved to Cheltenham because it is a district that stands out in many positive ways in comparison to others in Montgomery County. Why is the board using its neighbors to influence what is best for Cheltenham School District? Six, Mr. Schultz referenced the benefits of a hybrid model. What known benefits of a hybrid model can the board speak to? Many teachers who are currently in a hybrid model that is report that it is extremely difficult to meet the needs in-person and virtual students simultaneously. Seven, is the board at all concerned about the new variant of COVID-19 that is now in Pennsylvania that has been reported as more contagious and affects children more than the original virus? Eight, will students be required to complete age-appropriate training about COVID-19, similar to what the student athletes and teachers were required to do prior to being allowed to participate in the hybrid model? Nine, is the board aware that many teachers will need to share classrooms and space? This doesn't seem to be the case in other districts that have safely moved to hybrid. Final question, 10. What mental health resources have been or will be offered to staff who feel anxious or stressed about being forced to return to their school buildings against their personal will? That concludes public comment. Dr. Marseille, would you like to take any of that on or do you want me to or how do you uh, wanna handle that? Well let me address, um, and then if you can fill in the gaps or you can remind me what I did not uh, okay. 
uh, do not answer or answer adequately. Um, uh, with regards to the new variants, uh, with regards to the strand, um, uh, you know, listening to the medical professionals, um, it wasn't a, a matter of if, it was a matter of when. Every virus will unfortunately mutate. Um, with regards to our concerns, um, we've been concerned, which is why every Tuesday, every Thursday, since this virus, since we closed, we meet with um, uh, with individuals from CHOP, Dr. Rubin. We meet with Michelle Masters. We meet with uh, Dr. Arkush, and we discuss where the state is and the extent in which recommendations they provide us. Um, so if you're asking me, am I worried? Yes, I'm worried about the virus, period. Whether it's uh, 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 a this virus, any other virus, with respects to uh, that process. Um, with regards to threshold, and I've said this, um, we have all of our information on the website. We've been sharing this information throughout our legislative meetings. We've been giving updates. We've been sending letters to the community, um, helping them to better understand what shifts are taking place. Um, we, uh, the state continues to shift its model um, with regards to providing recommendations. We have a new attestation process that provides us with clear guidelines or clearer guidelines with regards to what that means. Mr. Schultz earlier in the conversation talked about uh, thresholds, talked about the idea with respects to um, uh, if we are not seeing um, spread within our buildings, that may be the safest place for, uh, for our students. There is no link transmission. Um, with regards to um, what happens in terms of numbers, we will follow and we will take advice from the Montgomery County Department of Health, from PA Health. Um, I'm not sure what Dr. Levin said with regards to middle <laughs> and high school should be virtual. The, um, that's not the case across the, the Commonwealth. Um, the reason why we, um, we use other districts is because it's been a common practice for us to think about what our neighbors are doing. Um, whether or not that influences us, I don't believe that is the case. If you recall, and maybe you have not recalled, but the, uh, we are the last district standing in terms of returning we have taken an extremely conservative approach to this process uh, in terms of our return. There are school districts in Montgomery County who have been open since September. Uh, they've had some preliminary challenges. We've learned from those. Um, there are districts who open in October, districts who open in November into their experiences. Um, so um, I don't believe that we are allowing other districts to influence us. We were the first uh, and only district in the Suburban One League to say we're not offering um, sports. And that was um, while other districts were offering those particular sports. Um, there are districts who are offering um, uh, kids to come back to school without six feet. We were committed to following those guidelines. Uh, so I don't believe that is an accurate statement um, at all. Uh, with regards to that uh, statement. Um, and with regards to the benefits of hybrid, um, the reality is, is as we've been having this conversation um, uh, since March 10th, and we've been trying to figure out even the report that I shared with this community that came out from the Pennsylvania Department of Education spoke about um, the benefits and the challenges of online learning and hybrid learning. And we're taking those into account when we do that process. It is not ideal, but the ability to be able to get kids who, and children who have been out of schooling for such a significant amount of time and understanding the social impact of isolation for those parents who have read our health and safety plan, who are comfortable with um, uh, returning their children, they identified that. We passed out a form Parents decided that out of these options, this fits my family better than, uh, than others. 
Um, with regards to training, that is been that has been part of our um, uh, of our program. Um, so the reality is is that that's part of our health and safety plan. We've been providing training um, that will be provided to our students before that. Principals are creating um, uh, videos for that. They're creating written documentation to help students understand what that is. They're going to go through uh, some. Um, some COVID training. Um, we know that we're going to provide that to them, but definitely are going to ensure that once they're in our building, we have a captive audience and they're going to review those um, uh, as well. Um, so um, that's my comments for the questions that were asked. Mr. Fishbein, if you'd like to expand or, and then after that, I guess, open up to any other members of the board, but um, I see no hands raised. I will. I mean, since my name was called out, and I, I think um, Mr. Ray, uh, there is, is one hand. Dan Schultz is raised, but I, I'll go first, and Dan, you can go next. Can you tell me the name of this uh, of this uh, community member, and I can reach out and share in more detail because there are things that are being asked that I don't think this individual is getting our communication. Yeah, it, uh, we can forward this email to you. Dr. Marseille. Okay. Um, the, the comment that I made is that the, my concern, and, and I think a majority of the board's concern to not have a hybrid model and instead stay fully remote is that we are it, depriving students of an opportunity for in-person learning that will give them benefit. There are costs to that, some risk, and we, we are the most risk averse school district in Montgomery County. And what we're saying is by February 1st, we're that balance of risk and benefit to we made a, a political decision, a, a practical decision that that was the time for them to come back. It, it is in our view, damaging to students to not have them come back. So when all of that is considered in the mix, we made a political decision, a difficult decision, but one that we thought was best on balance. None of these decisions are easy. We have been the most conservative when it comes to returning to school. And now we are giving the opportunity for the parents who feel safe. And, and, and we'll note that approximately 50% of the parents wanted their students to return. So that's, that's an indication that there is public support for the decision that we made. And um, it wasn't made lightly. It was made with consideration of all of the variables. And um, it, 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 if things get, it, it, this is the best we can do as a public body. That's all I have to say, Mr. Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Fishbein. And I, I, when you say political, I think it is worth clarifying and please correct me if my clarification is inaccurate. You're not saying political capital P, you're saying political from a dictionary definition perspective of relating to the needs of the public. Exactly. And Thank you for that. It, that could have been misconstrued in that. Well, I, and I wanted to underscore it because that is an important part of this equation. Um, it needs to be understood that while some families were able to successfully navigate an all virtual experience, uh, equity was alluded to in this question, and I see that the I see the decision to enable a hybrid uh, a hybrid model with an in person option as an equitable decision for our community. There were there were young children whose parents could not be at home because they had to work in order to pay the bills, and so we had second graders who had no parental support when something went wrong on their computer and would break down in tears. That is something that it's very hard to think about having a system that cannot support a student like that 
And the reality is a virtual experience you there are going to be situations where that happens and so by offering an in-person option the families that truly need an in-person option and are comfortable with the risks are able to be supported in that way so that i wanted to respond directly because this was the what are the benefits of a hybrid model i will also say that the the public isn't isn't a, doesn't see the emails we receive of families and parents begging to allow their kids to have in-person learning. Some kids, not even family resources aside of it, just as individuals do not function well with a virtual experience. On the other hand, many children do. And so uh, this is why a hybrid model provides families who, are, who have different levels of need and different levels of risk analysis to make the choice that's best for them. As far as why now instead of the fall, I think that it's important to understand what Mr. Fishbein alluded to earlier. We have learned a lot as a, as a district, but also as a country and a state. And that is where looking at neighboring districts is incredibly helpful. In the fall, we didn't have, in the fall, rather leading up to the fall, I should say, our time and energy was spent creating an, the most excellent online experience we could. And we needed to put our eggs in that basket. That was a good bet. We knew that it would be needed by at least some portion at some point in time. And that was part of, from a logistics perspective, part of the reason. And the other reason is there was so much unknown about the virus at that time that is now far better understood. The guidance from medical experts has changed um, since the fall. The, um, and while, while there are references to recommendations, the requirements and the guidelines are different. And the reality is the moment there is a case linked to schools per our affirmed uh, set of rules, those buildings will, will close. Um, and so if their risk manifests, um, it's not like this is a, an edict that cannot shift and cannot change. So um, I just wanted to note that. Uh, and I guess the last thing I'll say is regarding the question about in-person, I, I imagine we will be having that discussion is my, my supposition. And so actually I won't, I won't even weigh into it now because it's, it's late it's late in the day. Okay, thank you. Ms. Lohman, you have your hand raised. You're on mute. Yep, thank you, sorry about that, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Fishbein. I just wanted to also explain for what it's worth, and I know people will just, this is, you know, just words, but to express my thanks as to the teaching staff and all of our staff for being incredibly flexible and hardworking and responsive, you know, on the whole to what we have been asking, you know, asking them to do under the most difficult set of circumstances. And as the child of a public school teacher who taught middle school English and high school English for 27 years, I would never make a decision that would put an educator in harm's way um, that I didn't think th that if I didn't think that we could safely manage this situation in a school setting, I would have absolutely said so. I do think that it can be safely managed in a school setting. Um, I know that change is very frightening and that this is a particularly frightening change. And I just, for what it's worth, just wanna make it very clear that we are incredibly thankful to our educators for continuing to do such a remarkable job under such a difficult set of circumstances. And, um, and we have, we are aware of the concerns and we are still very much um, going to be monitoring how this is all going to play out in our district. Um, and I just wanted to add that in there because I hope, and I, I'm, I'm very saddened by the fact that there might be some educators out there and some families out there who think we're throwing our staff to the wolves, if you will, 
by by forcing them to go back in the school buildings and that yeah, I, I I hope that once people are actually back in the buildings and seeing how this all works, they will get gain a level of comfort that they don't have at the moment. Um, because I, I, I really do feel feel for them and their and their fear. And I just hope that we can manage to get beyond that. And that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Lohman. I really, really appreciate what you added to the conversation. It was a necessary thing to say. And I'm Sorry for not having thought of it myself, but thank you for adding it to the conversation. Um, and with that, I, I'm in receipt of this in of this community member's um, email. Um, if the name, if I'm connecting the name, I, I believe I know this community member and that individual knows um, how to reach out to me. Um, the last two questions with were specific to, um, is the board aware of, uh, teacher sharing spaces. We've shared that information, and I will be very clear to what Ms. Lohman said, that um, as uh, if I am following the health and safety guidelines per PDE um, in relationship to CDC, at a minimum, that is what we're doing, to the extent in which this district has exceeded those particular recommendations um, as, um, as, as well. Um, and um, I hope no one's thinking we're throwing our teachers um, uh, into the lion's den, because that means we're throwing our students into the lion's den uh, as well. And 50% uh, of the families who want them in the building. Um, and we are balancing that um, and following. Um, and with regards to mental health resources, we had that conversation on, uh, on January 6th, when um, some of our members um, raised issue um, about they wanted some additional information. And we provided that through Penn Behavioral Health and through other comments um, as, uh, as well. So I wanted to touch up on those last, on those last two and also say that um, in one breath, um, and I respect your comments, you can't say, um, why are you allowing other districts to make our decision for us or influence our decision? And then ask the question that says, why aren't we doing it like this district? Um, so, um, I went to comment on those and I believe I've answered, uh, to the best of my ability, those, uh, those questions. Thank you, Dr. Marseille. Uh, there are no other public questions in the box or in the question box. And I think that means we can move on to response to prior public questions. And we didn't have any that went unanswered. The next item on the agenda is future meetings as listed. And with that, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So move, Charles Burdell Williams. Second. second. Pam Henry. First, Charles Burdell Williams. Second, Pam Henry. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Hearing none, the motion carries. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you all.